CB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. It's half past seven on Wednesday, the last day of September. OTBM live with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you all the way through until 10 this morning. If you want to get in touch, 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. Uh, Daniel Harris is going to talk to us about Manchester United's Jaden Sancho bid a little bit later on. He still thinks there's a good chance that the English young gun is on the way to Manchester United. We're going to check in with Johnny Cooper, ahead of the Dubs' unprecedented drive for six. Former Ireland captain Keith Wood is going to talk to us about Ireland's front row options, the possibility of South Africa joining the Six Nations and the imminent link-up between the IRFU and uh, London Irish. Irish basketball star Sorka Tiernan will also join us and we'll have more transfer news, the back pages and much more coming up. First though, let's hear from Louise Galvin who spoke about her retirement from the Ireland Rugby Sevens team and working in Tullamore ICU. Now, very happy to say that our next guest is with us. She has played 96 times for the Irish Sevens team over the last five years, 37 caps in there, including the Sevens World Cup in San Francisco in 2018. Before that, there was football for Kerry, All-Ireland Final in 2012 and basketball for Ireland. And you might have seen in the last few days she's decided to hang up her sevens boots, at least. Louise Galvin, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. So that's quite the CV, bloody hell. Um, <laughs> your last appearance in February in Sydney for the sevens, so I, we, was it at the back of your mind this might be your last year? Has COVID kind of jumped in to accelerate things? What's behind the decision? Yeah, I was in the back of my mind that it was going to be my last year, but usually the season ends up around uh, July or August. So certainly in February, I wasn't thinking that this is going to be my last tournament. Um, actually, ironically, we were in, we played in Hamilton, New Zealand uh, before we went to Sydney and the Chinese team were being told they weren't allowed back into China because it had started to take off. So I remember all the teams talking about this coronavirus and um, we were like, oh my God, China have to just stay in, in New Zealand and Australia. They're not being left back in because they're being protected for the Olympics. Um, little did we know etc you know fast forward a few months later um i mean we actually still went on a training tournament in early march in france and again like the very first week of march um and that was pretty much the last uh last i suppose team um training that i was a part of mm. um we were training in isolation then from from march on until i decided um in the last few weeks that i'd go ahead with the plan and, and retire this season because i guess with covid I just don't know when sevens in particular is going to get back up running again, unfortunately. I know by its very nature, globe trotting, it just does is not compatible with COVID in particular. Yeah, it's it's the international travel, it's all the teams involved, whereas you know, 15s game, you can have one home team that are resident and one team traveling. Um, and then even the day itself, I mean, I feel really sorry for World Rugby and, and HSBC and, and all the different unions that are trying to um, find the safest and best way to get it back up and running again, because by its nature, you see how precise the game times are. If you've a, a double tournament, men's and women's, you could have 40 teams playing in one stadium you're probably sharing a dressing room with two other teams and it works because it's it's fluid. One team is out warming up, one team is eating, one team is cooling down and there's probably only one team at any stage in the dressing room. But now when you think of social distancing and, um, you know, wiping down surfaces, I mean, the day of a sevens tournament is so jam-packed, there's very little time to manoeuvre anywhere. Um, so they're going to find it very, very difficult to get this back up and running again safely. But I'm sure they will because... Um, obviously, being in the Olympics as well, it's just, um, I think it's, it, after the Rugby World Cup, it is an important money spinner for World Rugby. So um, I'm sure in 2021, they're getting it back up and running. But unfortunately, for the likes of me, they just kept cancelling tournaments that were up and coming until we can get a hold of this thing. Mm. And is there any concrete word on a resumption? You know, the 15s is starting to eke out some kind of calendar, thankfully. Sevens is still very much on hold. Very much on hold, yeah. So they've they've cancelled um, the start of the 2021 season, and at the moment we're still or the the we <laughs> guys are gonna have to stop saying that. But um, they're hoping that uh, I think Hong Kong in April is the next tournament that hasn't been cancelled that is is on schedule, okay. um, and they're you know they're putting in all these contingency plans because obviously um, the Olympics are going to be on in in August, and they need teams and countries to have had a a serious amount of game time to be able to put on the show that the the sport deserves so they need to have a minimum amount of 
um, whether they be regional tournaments or World Series tournaments, in order to allow teams to get up to that speed so that they can hit, um, hopefully, hit Tokyo 100 miles an hour. Mm. What an unexpected journey these last five years have been, I suspect. You know, you joined the squad at 27, probably travelled the world. This was not on your radar at 22, 23, 24, that's for sure. No, my radar, you know, I when I look back now, I think um, I probably would think I would have a very comfortable uh, job, uh, probably even mortgage, probably be nice and settle down, play a little bit of sport at the weekends. Um, but something inside me decided to throw all that out the window. Yeah, in my mid to late 20s when I got offered the opportunity to, yeah, play pretty much a new sport, um, move to Dublin, give up my job. Um, but I, although I may not be um, as rich in the bank as if I'd stayed working full time, I'm all the more richer for the experiences and for just the opportunity to play full time as a professional athlete. Like as a, a female team sport, it was the only one in Ireland that was doing this back in 2015. Um, and like just to be able to maximize my potential as an athlete, that was always um, my goal because I just love playing any sort of ball team sport. Um, and then it turned out that rugby sevens actually was a, a nice fit as well. And as you mentioned, like traveling around the world, like it was it was insane, like Sydney, New Zealand, San Francisco, Russia, South Africa. Um, yeah, America, Canada, been to some amazing places and all while playing sport. Like again, growing up as a as a girl, I never even thought this was a dream mm. that it was possible. So like as I look back and there are plenty of regrets as well, particularly not going to the Olympics, which was probably the ultimate goal of when I joined was I wanted to become an Olympian. But I still look back on, man, you've been pretty lucky, like. Yeah. It's been a pretty good deal. So just to get broadly get the timeline, I know you played a lot of GAA up until you were maybe 13, 14, and there was no girls team, and the boys started physically developing, and that became tough. And basketball stepped in, and then you went back to the GAA. Is it somewhere around 2013 territory, you lose a bet and you take up rugby, and is it within kind of two years of taking it up that you find yourself attracting interest from the RFU? Uh, probably, yeah, something like that. Like I was playing a bit of tag in the summers just to keep... Um, I keep a bit of fitness, a bit of crack really in Limerick. Um, and that was, yeah, that was pretty good crack. And then it was around 13, 14, obviously the, the women won the Grand Slam. Um, in 14, they beat New Zealand, as we all well know by now. And you could see something stirring and they're obviously making a lot of changes in terms of the, the sports structures um, within the game. So I started playing a little bit of 15s and yeah, I loved it. I actually really liked the, the physicality, that aspect of it. Um, but wasn't really ready to leave basketball or football either. Um, particularly football, because we'd had, you know, unfortunately my intercounty career completely coincided with, um, with Cork's intercounty career. I was yeah. actually laughing, but, but Angela Walsh, she messaged me on, just to say well done on, on um, re retiring. And I was saying, well, they could probably thank half the Cork footballers because you were just so, so <laughs> dominant at the time that I thought, here, I might as well try something else because we're not getting, or we might get them a Munster and, you know, all Ireland semi-final or final, they, they catch us again. So uh, it was pretty hard to step away from them. But then I think when you really, when you leave something behind, you're actually more driven to succeed because you realize I've stepped away from something that was pretty good as well. So I really better make a good hand at this, like. Yes, this better be worth it. And was I, you know, yeah. so, I mean, I guess, you know, you make the point about mortgage and, and finances and, and how do you balance that up with the experiences that, you, that you've had. But in advance of accepting the move up to Dublin and going full time, was anybody in your life saying, oh, well, I don't know if this is such a good idea or did you seek advice? Are you that type? <laughs> My parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, naturally. 100%. I don't know, though, were they using the whole job more so to stop me from leaving football because I come from a real GA background. Um, right. So I, I, I don't know, was it the football more than the job? But they were a bit like, what are you doing? But, um, you know, they, they were kind of asking other people. And in fairness, I'm not a very flippant person. I'm, I'm pretty, um, like, I, I made sure of my degree. I had a good bit of uh, work experience under my belt. So while I was playing the program, I mean, there's definitely loads of opportunities did a master's part-time. I made sure I kept my physio competencies up, did loads of part-time locoming work, which has allowed me, thankfully, to step back into mm. back into that um, that workplace, especially, you know, in healthcare, there's a good chance you're going to get a job anyway because it's always going to be necessary. And that's not none more evident than it is right now. So I kind of always had that idea that, look, if you take this break and step away, 
you work hard enough, you're going to make the most of this. Your career and, and the experience you've gained so far, it's not worth nothing. You can still maintain that. And again, I'm not sure what I've done a master's if I didn't kind of have that extra bit of time of mm. it. It's something that sits nicely with being a, a professional athlete. You have that bit of extra downtime where um, if you have on your own time, you can do a bit of extra study. So um, I kind of always knew I would do something with it. Um, I'd make the most of it because again, if you make a big enough choice, if you, you're stepping away from things, I actually really liked my job as well in the hospital in Limerick. I wasn't looking for a change, which is the ironic thing, but I think again, you step away from things you like from friends, from a comfort zone, then you're more likely to actually make a go of what you have immersed yourself in. What was the hardest thing to get to get grips with when it came to rugby then? Um, Probably the tackling or rocking and not so much the um not the physical physicality of it, but the, the technicality of it. Like <laughs> I'm quite I'm not very tall, but I'm quite long limbed and um For radio listeners, I, Louise has stretched out her arms just to prove yeah, the point. <laughs> stretched her arms around. Um yeah, like I'm I yeah, quite like long legs and a shorter body. So even just to get that tackle height of carrying, you know, dropping your dropping your height in, in your carries um, getting lower in tackles, that was probably, de well, that was definitely the, the hardest. Um, I think for a lot of us in, in Sevens program, we would, would have developed a lot from other sports. So, you know, footwork, stepping people, even even the fitness um, was okay. It was difficult. Like Sevens rugby, international rugby is the hardest sport I've ever played and I ever think I will play. Um, it is just relentless. Um, but again, you can train for that. But just around that kind of tackle height, rock height, that technicality around that was definitely the, mm. the most difficult thing. There is a glamour to the circuit, there's no doubt. Cool locations, there's a party atmosphere around the game, so, you know, we, we, we could all be mistaken on the outside for thinking it's a, you know, it's a great time and everybody's in the tear and, you know, it's a bit of a jolly. Uh, it's not. I mean, the, you talked about the fitness levels. I presume you guys are all wrecked at the end of these tournaments. Absolutely exhausted. Absolutely shattered, yeah. The most wrecked I've ever been because you're probably staring into a long haul flight the next day. And again, everyone's probably like, oh, boo hoo, you're coming back from Sydney in 30 degree heat. But actually, I just remember that last tournament, I think we hit 38, 39 degrees. We actually had to borrow, um, like, we are, we'd have, you know, quite top edge sports science and um, the medical team around us are all fantastic. Um, we'd have access to a lot of facilities, but we actually borrowed some of these, like, um, zip up ice jackets from I think it was the the Giants the AFL team for warming up in because it was touching 40 degrees and like it's absolutely disgusting seven minutes in and you think seven minutes is so short but seven minutes of flat out rugby is just like you're gone at half time mm. um, so although yeah you do see a lot of glamour around it like they're just such hectic days. You're up so many hours beforehand. You're eating so many hours beforehand. You're it's just go go go. Then you try and switch off after a game for like twenty minutes before you start and switch on again for the next game. Um, they're just absolutely manic, and you're shattered by the end of it. it. Takes a real good week to get over it, and that's even if you don't have that much um, that much jet lag. Yeah, I can imagine. And what's the vibe out there? Because the opposition teams are obviously spending a bit of time together, or you you know you, they're coming off, you're coming on. There's probably warm ups happening. I think often hotels are shared as well. Is it pretty collegiate and you could have a chin wag with some opposition uh, players or, 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 you know, pretty much this is our circle and no one's coming in? No, it's very collegiate. It's very, very friendly. 100% um, you're right. Generally, we are all in one hotel um, or it might be if it's a, even male and female, it might be both male and female teams with one hotel and you're eating just in a, an area for players um you're getting on and off buses you're very chatty like to be honest you're you know sometimes you hear about uh the different stories of here like um was it the the kerry donegal final 2014 of your man blowing the trees in the Stuart stadium i mean you could easily probably uh spy on someone because we're all on the one training grounds like we're you're literally getting off on bus on and off on the bus but it's kind of an unwritten rule that you know, you're, you're, the, the coaches, they're not looking at plays. And to be honest, so much of sevens is open play rather than what happens in a starter play. Anyway, it's not like a, a Joe Schmidt trick play is going to unlock any sort of a game. It's, um, you might see something, but it mightn't, come, <laughs> it mightn't help you that much when you're absolutely blowing four minutes into the second half anyway. Um, so it's very, very collegiate, very much. Like you still sit very much with your own team, right. um, but 
you could easily at the you know you're getting a cup of tea or a coffee after dinner after breakfast you're absolutely having the chat with whoever's in front of you behind you and you start to build up those relationships and yeah it's pretty nice it's it's really interesting to see how other teams prepare as well i mean how some are so, like the fijians they're just brilliant like they're the most relaxed um nation i remember outside sydney one year there was a, a, a bedding company that was selling mattresses and i was coming back from one warm-up and there they were actually inside on the mattresses that were just for you know the just for show like just for a bit of advertising and they were dead sound asleep and i mean they were in their gear they could have been playing just after us and it just works they still get a, you know they, they cross the white line they're incredibly um difficult to play against and they have their own style but i'm like man that would be unreal i wish you could just yeah. switch off for a secret mattress in 30 degree heat if i just saw one sitting there it kind of sounds like the ideal sporting environment you know in the very best sense people getting on and then when you cross the white line it's hell for leather but that sounds like a really lovely atmosphere you're going to miss this a lot then every day together you know full-time professional i you know no one wants to leave that whatsapp group when they have to step away and i saw you did an interview with the irish rugby website and you talked about you know good times and tough times i know you you talked about your father passing away uh, last year and the team were very much there for you there's a there's an intimacy about these kind of teams yeah, there is, because even more than, like, for an international team, we don't go back to many clubs, any provinces. So we are, you know, we are the residents of the High Performance Centre um, for the last year and a half, which is a phenomenal facility as well. Mm. Um, you're seeing the same people in and out. And then you're travelling. I mean, even the, you know, the, the coaching staff, we such a, a bond with them compared to maybe other teams because you're spending so much time in each other's pockets. You know their kids' names, you know their family names, you know what, what other interests they have, what films they're watching. Um, it just comes with the territory. So trying to step away from that is really difficult. And you mentioned leaving a WhatsApp group, but an environment like that, what you don't realize is there's probably about seven WhatsApp groups until there's a message into the nutrition group and you have to leave that and, <laughs> and the S&C group and the, the Bulletproof group. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm not even sure if I've left all the groups yeah, yeah, at this yeah. stage, but... Um, yeah, look, it is difficult. I think with COVID, it was a real like surreal way of leaving because I physically haven't had that training environment um, since last March. And I remember us leaving going, oh, right, lads, it was over the weekend. It was a case that we weren't coming back in rather than on a Friday being told this is the story. It was like, right, see you Monday. And then Sunday evening, we're told we're not coming back in. And I've met players like, you know, uh, for coffee or whatever, mm. um, but I haven't met the, the group as a whole. Um, so it's, it has been a bit of a surreal way to end as the, as the group were getting back training. I was staying working while I was still kind of figuring out what to do and just training remotely. Um, but then when the decision, it just became a bit more obvious that, I, you know, I'm lucky in ways that I'm going out in my own terms. Um, I have picked up a few injuries and in actually in sevens, the injuries are just as bad, if not worse than in 15s, because, OK, you might not have the same size of players colliding, but the, the force because of the speed they're going at, they're just as, as time consuming. Um, I'm lucky enough, I'm not absolutely crippled. Um, I can still step away and play club rugby, who I'm delighted to go back to, because as you mentioned, I joined UL Bowes in Limerick in um, 2013 and I haven't played a whole pile because we, have, we haven't been released. Mm. Um, back playing club football, um, was extremely lucky to win an intermediate county final uh, two weekends ago with the club down in Kerry. So um, the parents are very happy again and <laughs> <laughs> they've gotten their way. Um, so look, in another year or so, I could be waiting. There could be still no tournaments. I could be running out of form. I felt I was probably starting to slow down compared to some of the, the younger players anyway. Um, and I've been lucky enough, got married in the last year or so as well. And so... I guess when that happens, you have to start thinking of someone else besides yourself. Because I always think as athletes, we're the most selfish individuals going because the team always comes first. But um, now it's time to maybe just uh, refocus priorities a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So life now is obviously very interesting for lots of people, yourself very much included. I was reading that you're a physiotherapist, for anyone who doesn't know, and you're working in Tullamore Hospital. As I understand it, assisting patients who've been discharged from ICU, is it? Yeah, so initially I was working in Tullamore. I um, actually just got in straight away after lockdown happened. Um, again, lucky enough, I'd had that ICU experience and they were looking for a staff to help out. So I was there for pretty much the, the real hardcore um, 
full I full hazmat suits uh, working inside there with the, the Connor, the main physio and the staff. Um, I had been working there for the last few months, but I it was always kind of on a locum kind of week to week basis. So I've actually since I've stepped away from sevens, I've taken a position with the HSC in Dublin where I'm living. So a bit less of the community in mm. the southeast, the community. So I've actually jumped from that kind of IC with acute experience to working with doing domiciliary home visits with um, elderly people who quite the opposite more so they have been uh, i suppose their uh, the effect of covid on them is this kind of collateral damage of they've been stuck in their homes they're a lot less mobile they're a lot less um, likely to be going outside and they don't want to become burdens on themselves their family or society so trying to um, encourage them to get more mobile make sure they can get around their house and get out into the communities again so um, it's a bit of a cradle to the grave stuff all right um, but again i'm just delighted to be back and in full-time employment and to have the opportunity to do that whilst also kind of find my own sporting regime and routine now because I don't have the RFU feeding me and <laughs> sending me gym programs and um, I, have, I still have the GPS unit because of COVID I haven't been back in but I haven't turned it on because 23 weeks of um, doing three four running sessions a week I'm I kind of I'm okay with leaving that aside for a little while. Yeah, I would imagine. Why, I mean, the ICU experience for somebody with COVID, I presume, is is utterly terrible. Uh, abs yeah, it is. Like, and you know, we had a few cases um, in Tullamore that they were transferred from like different hospitals in Dublin and, and from the Midlands where um, their ICUs are full. So these people, when they were starting to wake up, they are in the they don't know where they are. Everyone's in these crazy hazmat suits. They don't know who who they are. They're being told they're an Offaly and half of them are like, why am I an Offaly? <laughs> of all places, why <laughs> Offaly? Oh, I know. But, uh, they're d and then there's a curry woman here beside me. I'm really confused now. Um, but it was incredibly rewarding because I think yeah. a lot of people felt so helpless during that whole time, that mm. whole period, especially if they couldn't work, that I was just delighted to be able to to go in, get into that environment, to be able to help out. Um, the nurses are phenomenal, and they they were they were just excellent, um, brilliant at as well, keeping that communication channel open with the next of kin and the family because it was so difficult for them. Um, yeah, it was actually a really rewarding experience. I also thought, like you know, I'm I'm young, fit, and healthy. I'm not going home to anyone that's immunosuppressed. Um, why not me going into this environment and, and helping out and they come back thinking, well, I didn't just stay at home and run around the field during that time. I actually utilised some of the, the skills and experiences I had before. And I don't know what you've seen with patients then discharged from ICU, but you know, increasingly we're, we're, we're hearing from you know, perfectly healthy people like yourself who might have run three, four times a week and were flying around the place, got COVID and got over it, you know, and aren't, aren't really being treated for anything anymore, but are just wiped, you know, six months on, can't walk up the stairs, palpitations, sometimes uh, still haven't got their sense of taste or smell back. I don't know, were you seeing a real variety in, in terms of the after effects for people? Yeah, a little bit of variety, but very much that level of fatigue and this shortness of breath on very minimal exertion was a huge issue. And unfortunately as well, um, I guess the way our, our health service is often set up is that we have a large emphasis on the acute services. Um, so when everyone's in ICU, people want to know how many numbers are in ICU, who get out of ICU, are they alive? Brilliant. But to what end are they having, a what quality, quality of life are they having? And I actually often felt sorry, we often saw on the news patients being wheeled out of hospital in a wheelchair and they're being told to wave and they have masks on and they're being told that they're the they're the survivors they're they're the golden children their quality of life is completely different and in our rehab services have probably never been good enough never been resourced enough and now they're even run, under resourced more because they're not considered priority enough to stay running during the covid um era and plus staff a lot of our, our allied health staff are physios ot's speech and language therapists they're being re redeployed to swabbing so for the average Joe watching on the news, looking at IC numbers and seeing people survive, it's great. But we also need to reintegrate these people back into their homes, their normal lives and society. And we're definitely not meeting that demand at the moment. And it's difficult. It's really, really tough. I don't have any answers, but I can just observe that and, and kind of report it back that we do need to pick up our rehabilitation. It's not about just getting people alive and out of ICU, you know, if they're used to being in full-time employment and right now they can't walk upstairs, but there's a big mismatch between their baseline and where they're at now. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, it's, a, it's a really good point and I, I suspect they're doing everything they can, they can, but it's probably coming, as you said, from a low enough base, you know, that, that whole area of uh, medicine in Ireland. 
I, you know, you're seeing uh, social media is no barometer of anything, but you're like you're seeing pictures of you don't want to say young people, but like predominantly just like young people dancing in the street and almost making a point lately of saying, well, we're getting on with our lives. And and then on the other hand, you are seeing people of similar ages who six months on are really struggling with the thing. And yet you're just wondering how can we get this message out that, yes, you may not die from it. You may uh, come through it. OK, but there's a chance this thing will wipe you for who, are, who knows how long, you know? Wipe you and God knows what it'll do to someone who has an even lower immune system than you um, that you probably know and potentially live with and, and love and, you know, a family member. It's it's difficult because, you know, I I always turn around and I, I say to, to Donna and my husband, I'm like, mm. thank God we got married in December. We were probably the last wedding that got done before it's happened. Yeah. And look, we're fit and healthy. No one in our family is immunosuppressed. We can go to work. Life is... I, I keep just keep thinking the perspective. I'm a big fan of reframing things with perspective. Life is pretty good because our worries are so much less than other people's. Um, but it's difficult. Like if you're trying to do a lead and start trying to start college, you'd all these ideas and plans and you see older siblings got that experience and now you don't. I know it is really, really difficult and it's hard to have that perception of what, you know, maybe before something really bad actually isn't that bad. But mm. now... They don't have that, I suppose, life experience of really serious illness of people passing away, and hopefully they don't. And it's up to us to somehow get that message across. Now, I'm not sure it's uh, paying social media influencers just to tell them to wear a mask, but we need to find a way of finding out how we can survive and live in this and look after our mental health, but also and and tolerate everyone and what everyone believes, but also protecting ourselves and definitely the most vulnerable people in our society as well and it's, it's not going to be easy um i know i for one i'm, I'm so glad sport got back up and running mm. like the irony is since i've retired someone said to me you know are you, are you playing anything i'm like now i'm playing more because mm. when i was uh when you're contracted with sevens all you can do is sevens whereas as soon as i retired i was like right back to club rugby back to club football um and i'm part of two teams again but i also have to always assess well you know i'm dealing with vulnerable people in the community I need to make sure I'm responsible when I'm going down to training, stepping away from training again um, and involving yourself in different groups. And I think that's up to every single one of us to always check in with our own symptoms and our own um, contacts to make sure what we're doing is is safe. And that if you just turn around and say you're a positive contact in the morning, um, that you were responsible in your movements in the time before that. And mm. hopefully then you're just being a good example to the people around you as well. Well, listen, the best of luck with all that work. I mean, it's so important and I hope it continues to go well. And congrats on the Sevens career. I mean, like we said at the start, what a brilliant, unexpected uh, journey it was. But uh, five years done. Congrats, Louise. Enjoy uh, semi-retirement. Thanks, Mill. Thanks very much. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Off the ball. I scored a goal in some kind of um, celebrity thing that I managed to get invited to but Bez from the Happy Mondays was a goal <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus I mean, like, he didn't put up much resistance but he had the decency he's a good goal Tom <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the highlights of my life like he was watching the match his head had been in goal it's like Oh, that was a good goal, Tom. <laughs> Off the ball. Weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. Yeah, good morning. Start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. You're welcome along to OTB AM this Wednesday morning. It's Jaron Owen with you all the way through until 10. Owen, good morning to you. A very good morning. How are things? Very good. The nights are closing in. They are. God, they are. The, the grand stretch that felt synonymous with COVID-19 no longer exists. They didn't tell you at the start of this thing that the weather wouldn't be beautiful, that the evenings wouldn't be long, and the pandemic would still exist. This wasn't what I signed up for. Championship under know. lights, though. That's what's coming. That is the thing. That is the, 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 the payoff. That is the thing you get in return for everything closing in is what is going to be an unbelievably, hopefully anyway, exciting few months from a Gaelic Games perspective, from an Irish sport perspective. Like the month of October looks stacked, to say the very least. The three biggest sports in Ireland, all with their 
three biggest competitions from you know qualifying for an actual major football tournament from trying to actually win the six nations and of course the gaa championships so everything is on the plate and while it might be miserable outside and while the pandemic may get more grim at least this is a silver lining on all of that um the big story in rugby in the last 24 hours has been the potential slash imminent arrival of the four major South African teams. We're getting the good ones. They're going to be mm. joining a beefed up Pro 16. We're getting rid of the, the two crappy ones, apparently, and we're getting the four good ones. And uh, it all has changed, utterly changed. Um, do, you know, do you know about the cane toad and Australia's introduction of the cane toad into Australia? Uh, if not fully, you're going to have to educate a few of us this morning on that. Uh, well, I should have done a bit of reading before I... Uh, basically, as far as I remember from the episode of The Simpsons that I watched, uh, yeah. Australia decided that they had a problem. They would introduce the cane toad to Australia to fix the problem. It was There was something the cane toad eats that um, Australia didn't like, and they were like, well, this cane toad over here eats this thing, and that's going to say it was a bug of some sort, a, a, slug, a particular type of slug. Well, the cane toad came and feasted on the slug and feasted on everything, and suddenly there was an infestation of cane toads. There was nothing but cane toads. Beetles. Was it? That's what it was? Yeah. There were enough beetles to make the cane toad feel like this is the land of milk and honey. What I'm talking about here is the law of unintended consequences, and that's what Gordon Darcy is talking about in his piece in the papers today. And uh, he's a little bit worried that um, we're going to have a lot of cane toads playing for our teams. He is slightly concerned about it. It's a really good piece in, in the Irish Times this morning. Just before that, uh, like a word of respect for, you know, the, the poor cheetahs here uh, and the, the Southern Kings. I know the Southern Kings have had their winding up order, but the cheetahs have just been totally ditched. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, like, oh, is it, like, is there uh, no appreciation here for uh, what the, the Southern Kings and the cheetahs brought to our life over the last little while? You know, the Southern Kings really led the way in empty stadiums. Yeah. Well, like before COVID-19, there were empty stadiums. The Southern Kings were the ones who gave us this feeling on a Saturday night that, oh, we've got a really good uh, provincial set up, uh, system set up here. And I actually think that that was actually part of a, a Trojan horse. And it was a conspiracy theory by everybody involved in the IRFU to say, let's get two really crap teams to make us feel better about ourselves. And I guess every team got those two fixtures every year to feel better than South African rugby. We all knew that they were the dregs. But uh, I guess uh, uh, over time, um, we started to think that actually, you know what, Irish rugby is better than South African rugby. What is going to happen over the next little while is that we will probably be put back in our place. And the positive possibility is that Leinster up themselves and, and get up to, to that level. And as a result, uh, the, the, the boat rises and everybody comes with them on this journey of just getting better. The drawback, as you say, and this is covered in, Gordon Darcy's column today is the cane toad and uh, the fact that everybody wants a little bit of the pie if they are utterly dominant, that they have such a ginormous rugby playing population that naturally the players who aren't making their big four teams are probably much better than the players who aren't making our four provinces by quite a distance. Like our, at the very top tier, there, there might not be a disparity, but when your Munsters or your Ulsters or your Connacht's, and in this case, maybe even your Leinsters are, are looking for that solution in any position. It may not be the academy player who gets the chance. It may be part of the cane toad that has come into this country and uh, has, and has brought the Pro 16 to a whole new level, admittedly. Yeah, look, I, I, it, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is this is going to be amazing. There's going to be regular top quality rugby every week. It's a, it's a shorter season, the way the, the fixtures are... are panned out, sorry, it's certainly a, a season that may take place over the same amount of time, but it will be fewer games, and so you will actually see more of the front-ranking players playing for the provinces. They're going to be playing against the best players in South Africa, and who are some of the best players in the world, and so we're going to see the South African captain, we're going to see um, the, the best back rowers in the world, the best second rowers in the world playing. Like, there is a chance that this is actually, all of a sudden, the best domestic league competition out there. Yeah, I've, I've heard you make that point. Uh, like, it, it, I guess time will tell. I, I think it's the more I thought about it, the more I think that it probably does become the best 
league, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, and maybe competitively, like maybe in the world as well. It, like it, it all depends on how Leinster and Munster react to this. But you'd assume that Munster have already got enough of a betting in period of a of a province that is strong enough to potentially take on these teams that are coming up as well. And Leinster are definitely. Uh, in that position, that if you do have two or three competitive Irish provinces and the South African teams do live up to the hype, then, I mean, how many sports leagues in in any code would you actually have, whatever, six, seven teams of, of really high quality? Not many. So that that definitely is the thing. The, the one thing to definitely keep an eye on here is just how potentially the, the Welsh teams, the, the Scottish teams and uh, and the Italians obviously will maybe dwindle uh, as a result of this as well. Maybe, or maybe... You know, maybe the increased investment because the money coming into the league is actually going to be more, you would hope. All of a sudden, the Italian teams can afford to sign better players and build better academies. And, like, yeah, that, that the only way is if the Italians get good at rugby. You, we can't just shut them down. Um, like, a little mm. bit of money would fix Italian rugby. That's the thing. If the rest of the, the Six Nations decided to make Italy a, a viable rugby nation, investment would do that. Uh, yeah. That, that's what it takes. All right, five, six minutes past eight here this morning. Shane Hannon is with us as well. Shane, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, lads. Keeping well, thanks. Yourselves? Where are we starting? We, I guess, have to start with that uh, Carabao Cup game last night. Um, decent match, and Mourinho giving out about the uh, fixture congestion for his team beforehand, and he's given himself an extra fixture to contend with after that win because uh, one all in normal time, jo uh, Jose Mourinho's side beating Chelsea on penalties then to reach the quarterfinals of the Carabao Cup. Uh, Frank Lampard's Chelsea had taken an early lead through Timo Werner's first goal for the club, but Eric Lamella equalised fairly late on for Spurs. Uh, Mason Mount then missing the decisive spot kick at the new White Hart Lane in that penalty shootout. Speaking afterwards, Mourinho said he was very happy with his players. They were the best team. They were magnificent. Uh, second half, a super team like Chelsea looked a very ordinary team, and they are not. They're a super team. We played so, so well, and uh, the team managed to wait for the for the right moment because is I told the players they should only think about this game but I have to think about three games at the same time and they, they thought only about this game they were phenomenal meanwhile fairly strange scenes during that game as well Tottenham's Eric Dyer forced to sprint to the toilet during that win in the second half he had to return to the changing room leaving a side with just 10 players on the pitch. And manager Mourinho blamed the incident on playing two matches in 48 hours. Well, Dyer says there was nothing he could do. There was nothing I could do about it, really. So <laughs> Nature was cooling. Um, yeah, so nah, thankfully, I heard there was a chance, actually, when I wasn't on. The, but thankfully, thankfully um, they didn't score, and, you know, and we've ended up with the win. Yeah, spawning one of the great tweets from Gary Lineker after that match as well. Uh, along the lines of players just don't crap on the pitch anymore. What's wrong with them? So uh, quite a moment in that match. Uh, Manchester United manager Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, meanwhile, says the handball law has become too complicated. They face Brighton in the League Cup this evening, having beaten them in the Premier League on Saturday, thanks to a dubious penalty decision. Solskjaer says the new interpretation of the rule is spoiling the game. You can discuss it all day long, but we need some clarity on what's a foul and what's a penalty. Because now it looks like you can just chip the ball up into someone's hand, like what happened to us against Palace, for example. Back in the old day, uh, it's, uh, it seemed simpler. That game at the Amex tonight kicks off at 7.45, as does West Ham's trip to Everton. Tonight's other two League Cup fourth-round ties see League 2 Newport County entertain Newcastle from half-past five. And at seven, Manchester City face Burnley at Turf Moor. A City, meanwhile, have signed Ruben Diaz from Benfica in a deal worth £65 million. The Portugal defender has penned a six-year deal at the Premier League club. Diaz is Pep Guardiola's third significant summer signing following the arrivals of Nathan Ake and Ferran Torres. Meanwhile, Argentine Nicolas Otamendi has moved the other way for a fee of £13.7 million. Did Dyer have, have, time to, did Dyer have time to wash his hands? I'm not sure. <laughs> I doubt it. I do too. Uh, I, mean, given I'm, I mean, I'm sorry, but like, look... Pandemic on, you gotta wash your hands. He's back out. How long has he gone? He's, he's I don't, I, the video that I'm looking at on, online, uh, it's like 70, 70. We had a graphic there of him actually running in, did we? Can we stick that back up? Because um, you can see the time on the clock. You know, I mean, look, maybe he did have time. Maybe he took the 30 seconds and sang happy birthday to himself twice and it was fine. But I'm just not sure. And I think that, like, you know, footballers aren't supposed to be role models. You're supposed to get your role models closer to home. So what time? Mm. That's him running back out. That's 77.06. 
Uh, Mourinho's following him down 76-01, so that's like a full minute. Do they have time to, see, to... I mean, maybe he didn't wipe. Who knows? I think, I mean, footballers, Premier League footballers especially, have a fairly clean and green diet. And he, it's not like he was on, a, on a, a diet of pints of stout the night before. So I'm sure he could go in and out fairly quickly. You're saying he keeps himself regular, like prunes and probiotics and stuff? <laughs> I'm sure he does. <laughs> just, just <laughs> The diet probably made midlife easier for him I, in there. So did they have to, I, I, so I didn't see this, did, did they have to like get the linesman to bring him back on or are you just allowed to run back on? I don't know. What's the, what's the protocol when you go off to have a poo? <laughs> it happens so rarely, I think we don't really know what the protocol is. I doubt the linesman and referee even really know what it is, but run back on. He, he, I guess he has to wait for the, for the break and player to come back on the Does pitch. Does he? Yeah, but... or can the referee just wave him on? I don't know. Yeah, that's probably why Mourinho wasn't too happy. Down a player for, for a couple of minutes. And luckily, Chelsea didn't score in that couple of minutes, so uh, saved Dyer's blushes, I guess. He followed him down as well. It was like, you know, I want to see what you're doing. I want to go in and make sure that, like, was he, was he for, what was he doing? Well, he didn't yeah, just want to hear him sing, sing Jolene to himself while he was washing his hands. Showed him <laughs> Mourinho the, the bastion of hope against COVID. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it's a strange one. And uh, the fact that Gary Lineker got involved as well just made it a little bit more special. <laughs> you don't see it too happen too often. It doesn't happen in Gaelic games yeah, too often. Well, I mean, yeah. Gary, Gary Lineker getting involved is like uh, Franz Beckenbauer coming out and saying great defending. Uh, like uh, that—that that is Gary Lineker's forte. And uh, if, he, if he's coming out uh, giving you compliments, you know you've made it. Where yeah. next? Yeah, let's hope he washed his hands because uh, speaking of coronavirus, Liverpool midfielder Thiago Alcantara has tested positive for COVID-19. The Spanish international missed the League Cup win at Lincoln last week and was also absent for that uh, 3-1 win against Arsenal on Monday. Uh, Thiago is currently self-isolating in line with the UK government's COVID-19 guidelines. Uh, a late goal from Ryan De Vries gave Sligo Rovers a 1-0 win at home to Derry City last night. Uh, the three points lift Sligo above Dundalk into fourth in the SSE Atristi Premier Division table. Some rugby news, South Africa say they will accelerate talks with the Pro 14's organisers regarding their representation. A special meeting of the South African Rugby Union voted to include Super Rugby Quartet, the Bulls, Stormers, Lions and Sharks in an expanded competition. The Cheetahs say they're reviewing their options, having played in the Pro 14 for three seasons. Uh, to tennis news, Stefano Tsitsipas survived a scare in the French Open first round in Paris yesterday. Uh, the fifth seed came from two sets to Love Down to beat Jaime Munar in five. Defending champion Rafa Nadal is in second round action against Mackenzie McDonald. That's today. Women's top seed Simona Halep goes up against Romanian compatriot Irina Camelia Begu. And Serena Williams' quest to equal Margaret Court's Grand Slam record continues against Vitana Pirankova. And finally, some Formula One news. Mick Schumacher is one of three Ferrari Academy drivers who will be given Formula One race weekend debuts in forthcoming races. The 21 year old, of course, the son of the legendary Michael and nephew of Ralph Schumacher. Uh, British driver Callum Illot will, both, will also drive in first practice at the Eiffel Grand Prix on October the 9th. German Schumacher will drive an Alfa Romeo and Illot will drive a Haas. Both of those cars are Ferrari-affiliated customer teams. Shane, good stuff. Thanks a million for that. Uh, more from Shane across today on otbsports.com and on the OTB Sports app. Now, OTB Sports, in partnership with Cadbury FC, have kicked off a brand new series of in-depth chats with some of the biggest names in world football. The third episode sees Gary Neville and Teddy Sheringham sit down for an in-depth chat which will be brought to you on OTB social channels and on OTB Sports Radio on Monday the 5th of October. Check out cabriefc.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. Still to come, Johnny Cooper, Keith Wood, Sorka Tiernan and much more besides. But I want to start by turning to Manchester United and uh, Daniel Harris is with us this morning. Good morning to you, Daniel. How are you getting on? Oh, we don't have him. We'll get him in one moment. Um, we're, we're talking about transfers and uh, interesting that we're mentioning Gary Neville there because Gary Neville on Twitter this morning says, Owen, oh, it's appalling that in this market, which is probably the easiest in Premier League history to get transfers done, the United haven't done more yet. They must get Ole uh, centre-back, left-back and forward pre-deadline. The others are managing to get things over the line. Why not United? Like uh, Gary Neville will be very, not, not very satisfied, but it will, it will suit his narrative a, a bit if they don't get any of this done. And if they don't get the job over the line, because he can then point a finger at Ed Woodward and any time they get beaten against a team such as Crystal Palace, it's Ed Woodward's fault because they only signed Donny van der Beek rather than his buddy Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's fault, which uh, obviously he deserves uh, to have fingers pointed at him as well after their poorish start to the season, certainly for the Crystal Palace results. Um, like I think that it's a tough time to do business for everybody and maybe teams are looking at an opportunity whenever Manchester United come in because they have had history of paying above the odds of paying that Manchester United tax as, as 
has often been the case. And maybe when they see Manchester United coming in, they're saying to themselves, God, we've got a chance of getting an extra 20 mil here. And that is the incentive. We've got Daniel Harris with us this morning. Daniel, how are you getting on? I'm good, thanks. You are right? Yeah, so uh, Owen's conspiracy theory here is that uh, Gary Neville is going out to bat for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And um, like most conspiracy theories, it has like a ring of truth about it. Uh, I don't think there's particularly a conspiracy theory. I mean, Gary Neville, I guess, wants the best for United and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wants the best for United and the owners want the best for the owners. So I don't I mean, it's entirely understandable that they would be aligned on this issue. It wouldn't necessarily need to be a conspiracy of, well, there's something odd going on here. Um, I mean, it's possible that uh, Ole has asked Gary Neville to use his platform to put some pressure on or that Gary Neville has decided to do it unilaterally. But a mate helping a mate do something for this common thing that they both love. I wouldn't necessarily say it's a conspiracy. Why Why are they unable to convince the owners, or is it is it Woodward that they need to convince that the right thing to do is to invest in the team? Why, why is that, like, who lacks the ability or the imagination to win the argument that actually investing in the team is ultimately going to end up making more money for the Glazers? Uh, I don't think it's as simple as that because let's let's say let's say United finished third last season without a particularly great deal of investment relative to the teams with which they were competing. So let's say that United decide that they're going to go and try and win the league. They could speculate 150 million quid. I mean, Chelsea have spent over 200 million quid, and we all know they're not going to get anywhere near winning the league, and they'll actually do well to get into the top four. Now. If you're as rich as Roman Abramovich and the reason that you bought the football club is to avoid getting bumped off or to do other nefarious things, which is the case with Abramovich, then it, then your major issue is not putting money in your own pocket. But it, the Glazers are not huge players like Roman Abramovich. And the reason they own United is to put as much money as possible in their own pockets. That's the only reason. They're not interested in football. They're not interested in community. They're not interested in any of those things. They're interested in putting as much money as possible in their own pocket. Now, sure, but a successful team is actually going to be more profitable I'm, than... A... Yeah, yeah, I'm coming to that. But there's not the, the amount of money you would have to speculate to have a chance of winning the league is not the amount of money that winning the league would return to you. If you can finish in the top four every season without spending as little money as possible, that is where the best balance is between money in and money out, if you're the Glazers, putting as little money in as possible, taking as much money out as possible. You could easily go and speculate 200 million quid, like Chelsea have done, and still not win the league. That is not financially prudent or sensible, never mind in this market, if all you want to do is make money, which is all the Glazers want to do. They would, they, you, you speculate and you don't win the league. But even if you speculate and you do win the league, the uplift that you get from finishing first relative to finishing third is, again, not particularly reflected in the money that you make versus the money that you... I don't think invest is quite the right word because it's not the Glazers' money, but um, I guess the money that you spend. I think, I think though, there's, there's a counter-argument in that Liverpool have, have begun to... Uh, print money or push off loads of profit in the way that they have done their business over there. I guess it comes down to how well the club is actually run. So even even in Chelsea's case, the the supporters of Chelsea will point to the fact that they've managed to recoup a lot of money from their process of hoovering up all the best young talent in the world and then farming it out, selling some of that on and using that as the, the uh, money that they're investing. Obviously, the initial capital comes from Abramovich. From Liverpool's perspective, They've been relatively uh, parsimonious when it's come to investments and oh. similar enough wage bill to Manchester United. So there's definitely a model somewhere that the Glazers have not sorted out or, or that Ed Woodward hasn't sorted out that would allow Manchester United to continue spending similar to what they're spending now and actually uh, be successful. I think that Liverpool have spent quite, quite a lot of money. I mean, they've got the most expensive goalkeeper ever. They've got one of the most expensive centre-backs ever. They were the, the finishing touches. All bought from the Coutinho money, though. Like it, 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 That was a straight swap, effectively. What was? Uh, Alisson and uh, the centre-back are effectively a straight swap for Coutinho and but, 15 um, million. Right, but... Um, if when, when when United sold Ronaldo, for example, for I guess that's the most comparable deal, the Glazers pocketed almost all of that money, and United replaced Ronaldo with Michael Owen, Mami Biram Diouf, Antonio Valencia, and Gabriel Obertan. So that's a good example of the difference between owners that are, I mean Liverpool's owners also want to make money, but they're also interested in running a successful sports team. And I think the, the not the tipping point with the Glazers, not the tipping point, but the point where it became very obvious what was what was last summer. 
because United clearly needed quite a lot of work last summer in order to make themselves a team that you would say this team will definitely get in the top four. And the Glazers didn't put that kind of money into the team, which is why they had to go back and buy Bruno Fernandes. And that actually, for me, marked some kind of change because that was the Glazers saying, previously you felt that they wanted to make sure they finished in the top four, but they weren't particularly interested with trying to speculate that extra amount to try and give, us a, give, a, give a better chance of actually winning the league. But last summer it became clear that actually they're not that bothered about the top four either. So I guess their people have done their sums and the way that that, that, that was the way that they felt they would they would make the most money. And then what happened was, um, you know, I got a couple of injuries to the players that they couldn't afford to get injuries to. It was, was obvious that, that it was obvious that if Paul Pogba got injured, there would be a problem because he was United's only really top-level midfield player. Um, if Anthony Martial got injured, that would have a problem. If Marcus Rashford got injured, that would be a problem. And all three of them got injured, the three best players in the team. So then, and then it started to turn toxic. So then they had to, then they had a question to ask because then they would have to think about firing the manager, hiring another manager, and that would be expensive. So they decided to go and get Bruno Fernandes, and, and that made a really big difference. But now what we're seeing is that Solskjaer basically completed his half of the bargain. He improved the team, he got them to three semi-finals, and he got them third in the league, so it's the Champions League. But the Glazers have not given him the kind of money that he needs to really build a team that would challenge. Because again, Chelsea can finish just below United have spent in excess of 200 million quid and they're, they're not going to get anywhere near the top two. So it's, I guess, different different calculations being done by the owners because Chelsea's owner is cal is not calculating about exactly how much money he can take out. And you might, you might say the Glazers are wrong. You think that they're going about it the wrong way, that the, actually the way they could get the most money out would be if they had the most successful team. I don't, I don't particularly think that. But I think that Liverpool's owners are more interested in sporting prestige than the Glazers are because we see what's going on with their relative American sports franchises where uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have been run into the ground and the Boston Red Sox are competitive. Tampa have just invested a lot of money, though. Like, I, I, think that the, I think you're right. I think there has been a change in, in recent years. They've started to fire coaches much quicker in Tampa and they've started to invest money uh, this season in particular. But over the last couple of years, I, I actually I wonder if the new blood coming in in the Glazer family is going to have a long-term impact. And I don't know enough about them or the individual characters to, to speculate too much on that. But I guess it, it, it does come back to, ultimately, I would hold... Um, Woodward responsible for most of this because he's the one who ends up deciding who the manager is going to be and he's the one who ends up that deciding that we're going to spend all this money on Sanchez which effectively poisons the wage structure for everybody and that's the original sin that, that Solskjaer is trying to fix um, and in, when you start thinking about it in those terms you wonder if actually Solskjaer with his lack of experience is the perfect manager for Woodward who he can you know keep on this uh, um, tightrope essentially where it's like yeah you you are not going to fight me because this is your dream job and you got it a little bit early and you don't have the reservoir of political nous in the background to be able to manipulate things and maybe that's why people like Gary Neville are weighing in because that ultimately is the hinterland that Solskjaer has access to that might help him to win some political power. Look I mean I think Ed Woodward like you can see just by the the absolute state of him, that he would like the honour of United doing well and people congratulating him and him prancing about, beaming, saying it's all because of me. I, I don't think that it's Ed Woodward who's saying you can't buy players. Ed Woodward's life would be much easier if his ha yeah, he wouldn't have his house getting vandalised if he was allowing United to buy players. I, I, I don't think it's Ed Woodward who's stopping United buying players. We can talk about whether he's any good at negotiating. I mean, or whether he's any good at making business decisions, like giving contracts to all the wrong people when like, United you know, now can't sell. I'm sure that is on Ed Woodward. But the actual amount of money that is available for the manager to spend on players, I'm absolutely certain needs to go to Tampa to be signed off. And I'm certain that Ed Woodward would much rather, the Glazers said, go and spend 250 million quid this summer because that would enable him to make more realistic offers for players and that would put him under less pressure to offload players, and that would make people, in general, less angry with how things were going at United. So I, I think that you can blame Ed Woodward for some of the bad business decisions. Um, I'm not sure I'd blame him entirely for Sanchez. I think that it is partly his attitude that they should go and get Sanchez, and Man City wanted Sanchez, that he thought it would be a, a win. But ultimately, um, if Jose Mourinho had said no, 
we probably wouldn't have signed Sancho. So I think that is probably on Mourinho more than it's on Woodward. Um, but and I'd like to blame Woodward for as many things as possible. But it's not him who's refusing to sign off on transfer deals. It's the, it's the Glazers. OK, well, let's move from Sanchez to Sancho. Um, this one looks like, from the outside, it looked like it had been dead a week ago. But it continues to bubble away. Why is it continuing to bubble away? Is there a chance this might still happen? Um, yeah, I mean, I was told yesterday that it is thought that it will still go ahead. Um, I don't, I mean, United, United are here often where they make an offer and they get told what the price is, or they don't make an offer and they get told what the price is, and they spend time prevaricating over paying the price before eventually either paying the price or not paying the price and getting the player a bit later than they should have had the player. Um, I mean, we, it seems almost, almost cliche to, to relate it because we all know that that is what happens. Um, I think the fact that United haven't bought another right wing yet suggests that they think this deal is still possible. Um, Dortmund have obviously said you need to give us X and United are offering them Y still, Y plus one, Y plus 10, whatever. Um, and I think um, I think there is probably a good chance the deal gets, gets made. I, I think the thing is, is 120 million quid for any player in this market, in this economy is absolutely batshit. So... In theory, you could understand them saying not doing that deal, but then spend the money on other players that are needed. Because ultimately, I mean, I know Jaden Sancho would improve United, but in a way, right wing is not what United need more than anything. I, if I, I, United need a controlling midfield player and they need a centre back, uh, I would say more than they need a right winger. But you're also, I think, saying that Jaden Sancho is too good a player not to buy. And if you don't do it this summer, then another better team, bigger team, bigger team who are better at the moment might come in and do the deal next summer, which is why I think Chelsea probably felt they didn't have a choice but to spend all the money on Kai Havertz that they spent because if if Kai Havertz didn't leave Leverkusen this summer, then next summer, when hopefully uh, everyone will have more money because the world is a better place and Corona is kind of not not gone but being handled in, in, a, in a better way than it is now, Kai Havertz isn't going to Chelsea. And so I think they do probably feel that about Jaden Sancho. It's just too good an opportunity to pass up to get a player as good as he is and I also imagine that Ed Woodward is thinking Jaden Sancho will be extremely marketable. There will be there will be companies coming to United asking them to advertise and asking for Jaden Sancho. So it probably works for United getting Jaden Sancho if they can, and it certainly works on the pitch. Is, the, is there a sense as well here, Daniel, from Dortmund's perspective that they see this as a massive opportunity as well? They, of course, they're going to have more 100 million euro players available and they've got great young players at the moment but in this current crisis to actually have an ability to squeeze a couple of million out but every passing day this negotiation goes on I'm sure that's alluring from their perspective Yeah I think the thing with Dortmund is that United are trying to buy something that Dortmund don't particularly want to sell um, I mean they might be thinking that they have to sell the player because the player has basically set his mind on leaving but it, if ultimately, the worst case scenario, if the worst case scenario for Dortmund is another season of Jaden Sancho before selling him for 120 million euros, then that is not a terrible worst case scenario. So, United, United probably don't, Dortmund probably have more cards than United do. So, it doesn't make that much difference to Dortmund financially if they don't sell Sancho. It's not like when United overpaid for Rio Ferdinand when Leeds were kind of hovering on the verge of going bust and they, United paid. Leeds as though Rio Ferdinand, as though Leeds were in a healthy financial situation and mm. they paid a lot more money for Rio Ferdinand than they needed to. Um, it's a situation where Dortmund don't need to sell and United are desperate to buy. So we end up in this situation where I mean Dortmund have told United and I Dortmund told United what the price is and I think Dortmund will enjoy this posturing and I, um, I know that I, I think it's similar to Daniel Levy in a way where he wants people to know that he is a hard-ass negotiator. It's a bit of an ego thing. And when he says this is the price, that's what the price is. And you can keep coming back with offers below what he says the price is. But if you want the player, you have to pay what the price is. And that's what happened with, say, Dimitar Berbatov, where United messed around all summer, ended up having to steal him from Manchester City, effectively, because he wanted to play for United. And then, and, but ultimately, they paid what they were told the price was at the beginning of the summer. And all they ended up with was um, a player who they had to integrate while, once the season had basically already started almost, uh, who had to move cities, and they never quite integrated Berbatov properly. And that be, that was the case with Harry Maguire as well, who who ended up moving at a time uh, when football was beginning to begin, and he had to then move cities and integrate with his new teammates and get used to everything at the same time as hauling his personal life 
uh, to a different place. Um, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense to not have paid the money because it felt like this was a deal where United were not about to get him for much less. And as we saw yesterday, they offered whatever they offered, 90 million euros, 100 million euros, and Dortmund still said no. So it gets to a point where having had the player sooner is worth more than the additional extra money you may save. But the reality is that you probably won't save any money. For sure. And is, is your sense that there is, a, 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 from your information, that there could be a Havertz comparison here at all, where if Manchester United don't get Sancho this summer, that there will be enough of a crowded market, say, from La Liga next year, where it really becomes a head-to-head -head with maybe a couple of clubs to actually sign Sancho next year? Uh, I don't know. I mean, but you could you could easily see it happening. We don't know what's going to happen in the world. I mean, Barcelona had problems with money even before Corona, and Real Madrid spent three hundred million quid last summer. So we don't know what sort of state they're in. We also don't know how much Sancho is desperate to come back to England. Um, I probably said this before, but I remember listening to an interview he gave uh, when Dortmund played Spurs at Wembley last season, and it sounded a lot like someone who wanted to come and live in England again. But you don't know. I mean, Liverpool might fancy a wing in next summer and have a bit more money. Manchester City might fancy signing Sancho back. You just you just don't know. So the opportunity to have a free run at a player as good as Sancho might not happen again. And you would be foolish to assume it would happen again in a year. And what happens if you're not... The deal with Sancho that has kind of... United have been talking to Sancho before, this season, before last season had finished. And we're very clear that Sancho would not come if United did not finish in the top four and play in Champions League. And the Champions League is a tough competition to get into in England now because you've got Liverpool and City, they're the two first teams, they're going to get there. But then you've got Spurs, United, Arsenal, Wolves, Everton, who are fighting over those places. And it's not going to be easy to get there. So you want Sancho to help you get there again rather than rely on getting there again without Sancho in order to sign Sancho for roughly what you would have paid for him beforehand. What are, the, what are the chances we see a picture uh, of Jadon Sancho with a Manchester United scarf over his head or playing a Manchester United piano out of 10? What do you give that percentage chance that, that um, it happens in this window? Uh, I mean, I'm kind of guessing because everything that you say is subject to the Glazers and United behaving in a particular way. I guess I'd go about seven. I think United will sign Sancho because the circumstantial evidence of them not doing very much with any of the other money. They're starting to get rid of a few players now um, and they're probably in a position to pay the wages. Um, suggests that, yeah, they still think that deal can be done. So I'd probably say seven, but I, wouldn't, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm like anyone else, I'm guessing, because I, I'm not the Glazers and I'm not Woodward and I'm not privy to their conversations. Daniel, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. All right. See you again. Have a good day. So Daniel Harris giving us some thoughts on the Jaden Sancho situation. If you want to get in touch this morning, 0879-180-180 is the number. Uh, good morning. Start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. It's 8.33 this morning. Now, last week, AIG Insurance launched the 2020 Dublin All-Ireland GAA season with a tribute to club volunteers, members and frontline workers. Here's Johnny Cooper looking ahead to the championship. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. All right, delighted to say we are joined by Dublin's Johnny Cooper. Johnny, you're settling into the surrounds of a beautiful press box there. It is um, very modest, I must say, but Dublin GA need no expense there. They have the heaters uh, ongoing right through the winter, so... This is, a, this is a winter championship as well. We're looking out the window here, and it's lashing rain before a ball has even been kicked in a championship. You're probably uh, looking forward to one day... Uh, I guess settling down in a nice warm studio and not having to get out in this and do the hard yards in the middle of winter. Yeah, one way enough and at it. Um, <laughs> there is um, definitely going to be difference, I guess, yeah, in the championship. And I guess the weather and the fact, but you do play in it in the uh, national leagues and and that type of thing. So it's not that we're unaccustomed to it. I guess just not the championship weather as such that we used to. But at the same time, um, it's kind of exciting in a way. It's it's different, but it's you know, perhaps different in a, in a good way as well. So uh, exciting, I guess, the main word. Yeah, like, yeah, you have you were doing a piece with Joe a, a few months ago and you were talking about how, uh, I, I guess, you look at a lot of different sports, you, you are, do a lot of self-analysis. For a year where I think a lot of people have had to self-analyze quite a bit in all walks of life, what have you done throughout 2020? Yeah, well, I guess COVID, as you rightly said, in particular, gave people a lot of space, be it working from home or just in general, the Zoom calls and the connectedness that you can get anywhere across the world. So lucky enough to 
get in contact with a few people and teams, organizations, I guess, in the background, um, ask a couple of questions, try to learn as much as I could. So in many respects, I, I'm still trying to learn as I always am and hopefully will continue to do so, but COVID just gave a bit more of a reach. Um, as I said, and you know, teams, you know, like across Australia and some other things, um, were, were good enough to give their time. So look, I, I think that journey continues for me, um, and and no doubt some of the other lads did the same. So rather than actually allowing the pandemic to slow down your eagerness to learn, it actually accelerated that for you. Yeah, well, well I think certainly from my experience of um, the last you know, the couple of months of COVID, I think there was definitely times where extreme, I was extremely motivated and there was times where, you know, I just let things go free and as they came, be it training or be it learning or reading or whatever it happened to be, you know, it just wasn't working and, and just listen to your mind and body. But um, thankfully for the most part, um, I was able to stay on top of things and stay engaged. Um, and yeah, in some ways it accelerated and some ways, um, you know, we just kept tipping away around the learning aspects um, for me personally. So, yeah, I think, and hopefully it's a bit more as well. It's not that it has to stop now because all the lockdown, even though there's still a bit of lockdown, but so mm. still lots more. How do you manage to stay engaged? Is there a trigger you have mentally? For me, it's probably just listening. I'm probably at an age or um, experience maybe more so to, to kind of listen to you know what the head or what the, the body is kind of telling you more so so i might have a, a diary or a template or a certain number of sessions or whatever maybe in a week but sometimes the one on the wednesday you know it doesn't happen because you know something else comes in that i'd be more you know just be more i guess connected with be it you know friends and a few other things and certainly COVID has given me that space to you know, reconnect with the, the club, uh, friends, and just people in that space that typically the, the summer wouldn't have given you. So it certainly gave me lots of uh, perspective and balance. Um, and I'm very grateful, I think, for that as well, personally. When you mean perspective, what, what does that encapsulate? Is it a sporting perspective or is this nothing to do with football at all? No, nothing to do with football right. really at all. Um, you know, so many footballs intertwined into that. So, you know, as a game of football, um, there's a lot of big, bigger things at play or certainly last couple of months and I think lots of people have been saying that sports people and otherwise that just allow people to step back and for 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 other ways just press a bit of a pause button and just reflect stand back see where things are at in this part or that part of your life sports is obviously a massive part of my life so I, I, I think it's it's given me that space just to you know step back and you know um, have a look at the position I, I am on in the team and can I do more and can I add more value to the younger guys and a few other things so um, it's been good in that respect. And when you do have those conversations is the answer usually yes that I can add more value I, I can be doing more in my position in the team? Yeah I think I was I probably come to that conclusion at the start you sort of you know you know, in terms of the last couple of months for me, anyway, you know, where can I, can I add more value? What would my teammates like me to do? What would the management, their coaching staff, how can I grow? Where is the growth? Um, and there's obviously lots of it. And with a new management and coaching staff, you know, very initially and straight away, you're getting a new perspective and a new thought process and opinion on different things. And, you know, there's growth straight away. And then there's a couple of newer, younger guys in. And again, you're trying to, well, then, I take your position, but you're also trying to impart some knowledge as well. So um, there definitely is lots of it. It's just trying to stay connected and, and tuned to, um, you know, my position on the team. And if I can add value, I'll well go to it. If I can't, then, you know, let's look at something else. It, it, I'd say that must be a really difficult balance to strike between doing your best for the team, as in trying to tell the new up-and-coming corner back how to be the very best version they can, and also trying to hold on to your jersey. How do you manage to find that balance? I just think you have to be, in my experience, completely open, completely vulnerable, and put all the cards on the table. Um, you know, and whether that's the, not that I have any secrets, but that's the biggest secret that you've ever come across. And the new guy in the door, and you tell him, or you, you, you work with him, or talk to him, and you just lay it all on the table. Because at the end of the day, if it's going to make, and it might obviously it might connect with the person at all, but if it's going to make somebody better, then in turn, hopefully, that will make you a little bit better, or certainly allow you to be more connected. And I think that's the position one of the positions that I have is just to stay connected with as many people on the team to particularly younger guys to make sure that in five seven years time they'll be doing the same thing and hopefully the cycle will continue 
how important is that mentality to going on a very, very successful run like the Dubs have done over the last few years? Because I guess that is a mindset that you can really double down on when you are coming from a very high base every single year. Yeah, well, I think the older guys, um, guys have been there for four, five, six, eight, you know, uh, kind of years, have a particular responsibility to make sure that the behaviours, uh, the vibe, the energy that is circulating and it's in the air almost in our environment, in our culture, is there and it's maintained. And obviously the newer guys coming in and they're all extremely talented and, and um, emotionally intelligent and in their own right, so they do pick it up. But I think at the same time, it's... And on the flip side of things, it's taken, it's being curious. What does the, the guy in the door reach? What does he think? What does he see? What could we do better? And I think there's a bit of both, I guess. Here's the standard, here's a template, but at the same time, nothing is rigid and fixed and you can take this socket out and put in that socket. You know, so there's lots of different things and um, that are there and play into it. And at the moment, we're lucky the dynamic is good. There's obviously no guarantee it'll stay that way. You have to work hard at it like anything else. So we'll continue to do that, hopefully. I definitely got that sense, even though we only got a few games to see this year, that that's kind of how the new management were going to operate as well, that there was obviously this brilliant body of work that already existed within the camp, but it's still no harm plugging out a few things, plugging in a few different things. Yeah, and sometimes just plug out the whole system, just just take it out from the wall and see how the group react and what then needs to get back in as quick as possible. Obviously, some things are very critical and, and you can't take out everything, of course, but but certainly there's new things you can try, there's new styles, there's new parts of language, um, there's new ways you can communicate as such in terms of what's said. So there's plenty of different things and I think and that's like, it gives you obviously a freshness of voice, freshness of opinion, freshness of perspective, of thought. And then at the same time, as we spoke about earlier on, you as a player, you're trying to earn your little bit of space and is what I'm doing enough? Is he seeing, is he seeing the the value that I can have, or maybe I need to go and ask them for more fee. So all that just gives you, again, a bit like the kind of COVID situation, a bit of a press pause button, a bit of a reflection space. Okay, where do we need to go? What, what does he want to see? What does coaching staff want to see? What value can I add? And um, as I said, hopefully that will, time will tell, obviously, but hopefully that will um, play dividend in the long run. How close a relationship did you and Desi have at club level before he comes in to being Dublin manager? Yeah, would have worked with Desi directly, I guess, for kind of that year with the club um, that, that, that he had us with the club senior teams. Mm. That would have been my main engagement with him. Um, yeah, involved in the kind of leadership of that team. So I guess would have worked close, close enough um, with him as well as some of the other guys on the team for that year. I would have known him for plenty of years previous, but not in that regard. So I guess now the Dublin side of things, it's kind of my second year, if you like, being involved uh, underneath him. What's his philosophy on football? Like, I know that could be such a wide, vague question to ask, but if you could pin it down to something, what, what underpins Desi Farrell's philosophy? I just think playing kind of with freedom and uh, being energised. Um, and again, that's probably a bit of a vague and a wide scoping answer to respond with, but, but I think that probably is and probably encapsulates. And even if you look at kind of tapes of him and his coaching style of last with the underage teams and even went to the club and so on, just trying to present yourself in such a fashion that, yeah, you'll have the parameters and Hill and his coaching staff will, will, will help you um, craft them parameters for when you're inside that box just to be as creative and open and expressive. And, you know, and that can be equally as effective or, or, or not, but as effective on offense or on defense. So, yeah, that expresses And I think that that probably comes back to his nature of um, his original profession and, you know, the, the health side of things and being caring and just giving people space to grow and, and that type of thing. And you probably see that and it's probably evident in, in my experience so far. How much of an icon was he to you when you were a kid in the 90s watching that Nafina team, watching that Dublin team? Yeah, would have been extremely fortunate. Um, would have remembered they played on a Wednesday, uh, Wednesday league games in Dublin at the time and himself, Jason. And uh, sorry, himself, uh, Jason and Sen and Connell in particular would have been kind of the three idols or heroes, as well as many other people, Geezer and a few others over the years then thereafter. But um, yeah, I remember watching them all the time. Obviously didn't get to know them for a good number of years later. Um, but certainly when you look back, and I think that's part of the environment, and you're, you're, sometimes you're lucky to have these engagements, and obviously it's come full circle now. You're kind of working close enough with them, having watched them for so many years on the sidelines. So... 
I guess time will tell um, with regards to how successful or how, how far we can get um, uh, together and we'll see what that journey takes. How good was Geezer for that Nafina team? Yeah, there's some people that um, like you can just see, like, you, like you see your Paul O'Connells, and you can just, even when you're watching on TV screen, it's palpable, it jumps through the screen. But you can just see the energy, you can see the authority, you can see the space. You can see it obviously in plenty of other athletes in all sports around the world. Um, and that's what would have been, you know, would have, would have had that kind of, you know, just attraction towards him. And he didn't often play those club league games because he would have been up home um, around that time. Our were pretty successful. So wouldn't have been playing. But when he was playing, you could see the preparation. And before eating pasta was cool and now it's not cool. He was... <laughs> The gym was cool and so on. He was doing that type of thing. So, um, yeah, massive influence. I'm lucky enough to have met him a few times and spoken a few times over the years, recent years as well. And just about being thankful and grateful uh, for him. And he obviously wouldn't have known at the time, but for his influence. And I know lots of people have different influences and role models, but he certainly would, would have been one of my, um, as well as the lads, but one of mine um, growing up. Yeah, because like uh, again, comparing him to, to Paul O'Connell is really high praise, and I, I guess there's something about the sort of characters that we often can't put our finger on. As you know, what what is the thing that drives them beyond the obvious thing of winning a Grand Slam or winning Sam Maguire? I'm not sure. Is that something you ever managed to dig into in your conversations with Kieran? Oh, probably not. Haven't got that far yet because we're on opposite sides of the <laughs> potential potential opposite sides. Yeah, um, but certainly it's some of the conversation I've had and you can just see you can see how deeply um connected he is with a few you know a few ideas and where he comes from and his values and his behaviors and you put him in a similar and again these are just my opinions or my I guess reflections growing up like Sir Johnny Wilkinson and how kind of connected they are with a deep rooted higher purpose you know wanting to change lives change communities and I don't know here on geezer's higher purpose as such but you can kind of just get that sense of there's something always bigger going on um and he's kind of all of himself forward um anything that i've seen anyway put him all of himself forward to see i guess who else can gain from it so um interesting maybe one day it's down with a cup of tea in a few years yeah absolutely that'd be a conversation i think everybody would love to to listen to um the point of a higher purpose is actually really interesting because if you have it naturally, that's great, and you can fight for that higher purpose. I wonder if there's like a psychological thing that players can do to almost, uh, I don't know, artificially create a higher purpose in their own head. I'm not sure if that's something that the players do, or if that's a psychological thing that you can actually tap into. Yeah, well, I think it's very important. Number one, I, I don't know how much you can you can force it or, or fake. It's probably a wrong word, but force it. Because the higher purpose is going to probably keep you going through the very, very bad days and very, very dark moments. And if it's kind of not based or not anchored or not connected to something really strong, then it will probably um, you know, get taken away at the tide at some point. So I, I think it's a very good point you make. I think lots of athletes and people often have, you know, whether it's you know, changing other people's lives or changing the community or whatever it may be, um, always have that going on. So... It's an interesting one. You could probably get into a whole conversation in itself uh, with regards to power in it. And look, people use them, people don't use them, have probably had success as well as athletes in this team. So there's probably cases to be made on both sides of the fence too. For sure. Uh, there's just one other thing I wanted to ask you about, Johnny. Uh, I've just been reading Bernard Brogan's book over the last little while. Uh, I think there's one page in particular where you come out of it looking extremely good, especially in the, the gym sessions. Um, yeah. Those gym sessions in, in St. Clair's, you mentioned it there in relation to seeing Kieran McGinney doing a bit of work in the gym. For you, it's Bernard Brogan that uh, he picks you out as one of the, the, the high performers in those sessions. What is the secret to that? What, what were those sessions like during, I guess, Bernard's time there? What are they like now, uh, those gym sessions, and how competitive can they be? Yeah, well, I, I think it's probably no different in some ways to kind of walking over the white line onto a pitch when you're walking into the gym environment. We have a very um, lucky enough to have Brian Cullen leading us in that direction and, and the support staff there. So I think it's it's quite competitive in its own right. Um, I haven't read Bernard's book or, or that particular um, uh, instant that you're talking about, but I think when you go into the gym, it's quite competitive and there's, there's all sorts going on. There could be your, your weights, there could be your cardio, there could be a bit of extras going on. Um, but, but I think the whole time is always a good energy and a good vibe. I think that's the main thing, how it can be competitive and should be competitive, but it also should be, I guess, energetic and feel like you're flowing to the right place. And bear in mind, if you have 
a certain challenge going on that the guy beside you wants to beat you. And at the end of the day, competitiveness uh, inside is an important trait to have. So um, they're still enjoyable. Uh, I can say that. And they're still challenging, certainly from my perspective. And um, I guess long may that continue because it breaks things up a little bit as well. Um, and get you away from the pitch in, in some cases when you don't need to be there and so on. So, um, yeah, enjoyable. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll continue on that thing. Uh, Bernard described you as a process ninja. Uh, what, what does that mean? Process ninja. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess just step by step and just maybe following the instructions that you're given. I, I think there's process and then there's creativity. And I think both are very important uh, to be yourself and to be innovative and so on. At the same time, there's only so many, many ways you can cycle a bike or <laughs> get as many meters up for, as 30 seconds or whatever it may be or on the rower. So, um, Interesting process, Ninja. I haven't heard that one, but uh, interesting. OTB AM. What type of ninja are you, Owen? Oh, uh, if he says that it's uh, if he's comparing a creativity ninja with a process ninja, let me be the creativity ninja there. Is that, are they the two options? No, I don't. I don't think. I think he's saying that you know it might be. Uh, I'm also creative, even though I am a process ninja. There was like a. Hang on a second. Don't, nobody put the baby in the corner. Uh, 8.50 this morning, time for us to uh, take you through the papers. We'll start with otbsports.com. Van de Beek's agent baffled by United's treatment of Dutch midfielder. This is a good sign, right? What are we, like a wet week into his time there? And already the agent is whining about the fact that uh, Van de Beek is on the bench. Some of the other stories for you. You'll lose a lot of money picking against LeBron. Farmer Jones speaking last night on the show about uh, the NBA Finals. Manchester City th throw another $71.5 million at defensive woes with Diaz capture. And Kenny says assumptions shouldn't be made over Delap's eligibility. I was like, Kenny Cunningham? But actually, of course, it's Stephen Kenny. Every time I see Kenny now on our uh, site or anywhere else, well, particularly on our site, I'm like, geez, Kenny's... Oh, OK, it's the Ireland manager, not Kenny Cunningham. Uh, anyway, let me take you through what's uh, going on in the papers. The Daily Mail, full backing, Coleman still my captain, insists Kenny, and joy for Jose. Spurs boss knocks out former pupil Lampard. What a great relationship they had, but apparently there were angry words between them last night as well. Fitzgerald backs Munster Club Championship. This is Davy Fitz, who was out uh, doing media yesterday, and of course the South African big guns cleared to join Pro 14. The London Times, shame stars facing Axe. This is Mason Greenwood and Phil Foden, still not in the England uh, setup, and Wimbledon set for 2021. So maybe the pandemic insurance doesn't kick in for a second year and they've actually got to play the tournament. Uh, handball rethink referees to be more lenient on law following penalties outcry. It's almost as if they're responding to new information. Uh, Dortmund tell United to up Sancho bid to £109.6 million. So that's €120 million, Euro obviously, at the moment. Um, and that's from Fabrizio Romano, who was getting a shout-out from Gary Lineker yesterday on Twitter as well for his uh, transfer gossip, which is high praise indeed. The Telegraph, Greenwood and Foden to stay ex uh, excluded and uh, that's Eric Dyer leading the celebrations hopefully with his clean hands after uh, rushing off to do a poo uh, racing posts from page uh, Rouget exudes confidence in Sotsas bid and uh, they also have Manchester United beating uh, Brighton in their prediction tonight United can clip Seagull's wings in rapid rematch the Independent has an exclusive exit threat of Selbridge players Stokes Kildare crisis. Uh, reports circulated around the county in recent days that Mick O'Grady, Kevin Flynn, Paddy Brophy and Fergal Conway will not make themselves available because of the way that their semi-final club defeat to Moorfield was refereed. Their uh, review of the game found the free count against Selbridge 32-13 and now apparently the players who play for Selbridge are not going to play inter-county or they're considering not playing for the county team because of the way the club was refereed in the semi-finals. We'll talk about that in a moment with Owen. Uh, the examiner, Davey, my heart and COVID weren't going to stop me, so that's Davey Fitz battling. Uh, Kenny praying Ireland stars get through Sunday service before Euro showdown. It's squeaky bum, bum time, really, um, from an Ireland perspective. And very quickly, Thiago Shock, new Spanish signing test positive for coronavirus is the back of the mirror. Mourinho, shut it, Frank. That's uh, the contretemps they had on the semi on the sideline and then a potty mouth Jose and Dyer feeling flush that's uh, on the runs Dyer makes his exit this is obviously tab of the morning to you Eric Dyer came out of the toilet to dump Chelsea out of the Carabao Cup on penalties uh, are there any more puns that are worth doing 
Chelsea's team of Werner and Spurs star Eric Lamella scored either side of Dyer's second half dash to the loo before the England defender took number one in the shootout and slotted home. They should have they should have made him take the second one, shouldn't they? Just for the punts. Yeah, poor, like, I mean, why didn't Jose Mourinho think about the tabloid writers last night? Mourinho said of Dyer's mad dash, he had to go, no other chance. It's normal when you are dehydrated. I was trying to put some pressure on him to play. Banging on the door of the Jacks. Has that ever made you go faster? Imagine Jose Mourinho being in that position. I mean, it's quite a paternal thing to do. Hurry up and get off the toilet, will you? We need to get out. That's, um, you know. Uh, and the star this morning, give it a lash, Jack. That's um, Kenny, I wasn't put under pressure to pick Ace Byrne. And 118 million or no Sancho deal. They've obviously been listening to deal or no deal here. And Thiago absent due to COVID is the headline there. And it's uh, Gordon Darcy's column, which we'll talk about with Keith Wood in a little while, is about the great migration north will change everything. So he's um, saying hasten slowly is essentially the message from Gordon Darcy this morning in the Irish Times. Where do you want to start? That Colin Pease story that you mentioned on the back of the Irish Independent is very interesting. The headline, just a reminder, is Exit Threat of Selbridge Players Stokes Kildare Crisis. So a dispute at club, club level may impact the Kildare County team, it turns out. He's spoken to Connor Brophy, who is one of a number of Selbridge players who've been left disillusioned with refereeing decisions in a semi-final defeat to Moorfield over the course of the weekend. So uh, the four players, Mick O'Grady, Kevin Flynn, Paddy Brophy and Fergal Conway, will not be making themselves uh, available for Kildare now as a result of the officiating in the club game. As regards to what specifically happened here, uh, a Selbridge review of the game found the free count against them was 32-13. So a lot of frees given against them, uh, not specifically what types of frees they felt were going against them, what, what, what sort of moments uh, were involved here. Um, but Conor Brophy, as I say, is on the record. He says... They're all a bit disillusioned with the officiating the last day, which left a bit of a bad taste. At the moment, the lads feel they need a bit more time to get their heads around what happens. The stats speak for themselves. We don't want it to seem like sour grapes, but when you watch the game back, we feel the evidence is there. Uh, I would have contended the stats do not speak for themselves. You've got a free count of 32-13 in one direction. And I would just like to know... What specifically are, are the recurring incidences here? Is it that ridiculous for a team who are on top to have 19 more frees? Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe, it is. Maybe there is never a, a, a game in, in, in Gaelic games where you'll have a 32, 13 free count. It does seem to me that 32 is extraordinarily high, is the one thing, as, as opposed to the, the disparity here that uh, mid-teens is, is sometimes what you would expect from a game like that. But... I think there's there a little bit more meat in the bone needs to be put on this uh, uh, with regards to why they've taken this to a whole new level and have decided to not actually play for Kildare. They must be, in their opinion, it must be one of the worst refereeing performances ever. But uh, again, I, I didn't see the game. And they do say here, Murfield are such a great team that you'd always know you're going to have a tight game against them. And that's exactly how it was. So maybe the fact that it was a tight game and yet Murfield had 19 more frees than them points to the disparity and that that, that points to, to the fact that the stats do actually speak for themselves. It seems to have been a two-point game, would that be right? Uh, the the, the if score isn't actually carried in the uh, report, but I'm, I'm just uh, doing a quick uh, Google here. I, like, there has to be something else to this, right? There's no way that four players who want to play for their county are not going to play for their county because of the way a match is refereed at club level. That doesn't make sense. You're punishing yourself because you're not getting to play for your county, which presumably you want to do. You're punishing the supporters of Selbridge, who are also Kildare supporters again. You're, you're punishing the rest of the county's supporters and you're punishing the inter-county management and your colleagues because of a refereeing performance in the club game. It seems like there's a disconnect there. They obviously believe that there's some, some ulterior motive which is not specified. And at that point then suddenly you're into unusual realms. Like every, every, mm. Anything is possible. You know, we've, we've seen that um, club rivalries inspire uh, some poor decision making like right across the country in, in all sports, but in particular, the people take uh, club rivalries in GA very seriously. So, like, 
Why would you punish yourself for something that somebody else did? You know, the, the thinking doesn't seem particularly clear unless they believe something else is going on here, right? There's the, the, like, as I say, the quote here saying that the stats speak for themselves. That doesn't add up to me. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying that it, it wasn't a terrible refereeing performance, but nothing about the story speaks for itself. No, nothing about the story can be summed up into two columns on, on the back of the Irish Independent here. It's, it, it's a great scoop, but I'm just confused as to, to what's actually happened. Like, a couple of potential theories on it is, like, you, Jack O'Connor is the, the, the county manager. He, he, Moorfield was his, was a club he was involved with a couple of seasons ago. Now, from the tone of the quotes, there's nothing against Moorfield here. So the Jack O'Connor to Moorfield connection perhaps is... Is, is nothing there at all. The, the second theory you could possibly have, and maybe there's a bit more credence you can put in this, is that the referee would obviously have been appointed by the Kildare County Board and they feel that the refereeing performance was so bad that they can't actually go out and help out the Kildare County Board by talking off for the county team. But you're they not... Like they, 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 this whole thing that the, the county is... The county team is owned by the county board is nonsense. The county team is owned by the players and the supporters. County board are just a bunch of self-appointed trustees who happen to open the uh, training facilities and organise stuff around it. The team management and the players and the supporters are the team. And by re refusing to be part of that, you're suggesting that something is untoward within that dynamic. Like you're, you're going on strike from playing county football over something that other people over here have done. So that, that line of thinking just doesn't seem very clear to me. And again, it would suggest that they believe something more sinister was going on here. And if they do think that, they should just come out and say it. Like, everybody's a grown-up. And for the sake of clearing the air in Kildare football, and let's face it, like, Kildare football has been a bit of a shambles for the best part of a decade. It's been a long time since they've been competitive properly in Division One as a Division One team, as a team who could aspire to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Dublin and and use the massive population resources they have to build a team and a style of play and an identity. And there's been no sign of that happening. And maybe Jack O'Connor is the man to do that, but is he going to be able to do it without the four Selbridge players? Unlikely. Uh, so you'd hope that cool heads will prevail, conversations are had, and some clearing of the air actually happens here because, I don't know, it seems, it seems remarkable, isn't it? But it, do, it does seem like something that someone might say for a couple of days after a big injustice you know like i mean yeah uh, we're, we're we're not i'm not playing football anymore i'm giving up i'm not i'm not talking off anymore and that's it i'm done with this game yeah you, you expect that to subside over time this is wednesday morning this is still a few days later presumably they're having the conversation last night this is something that isn't just a one weekend i'm done with the game sort of thing there is something a little bit more here and we don't know what it is so i don't know it's, it's like it's the, the last thing i'm sure jack o'connor would have wanted i mean it's the last thing they need in a knockout championship this year to have uh, a kind of a, a shoestring team uh, available to them and not have one of their main clubs being uh, fully bolstering the team free, free count does seem very high for a game that's a two-point game in fairness you know if it was like a 622 yeah. to three points and there was a lot of fouling going on you can see why um, the free count might be heavily weighted one way or another. And so, look, maybe uh, maybe that's the conversation that needs to be had, but get out there and say that. Get out there and, like, you know, if you, you think of that moment that Rob Kearney has to stand up and, you know, be vulnerable in front of the group and say, I think the Munster players take it more seriously when they're playing for Munster than they do for Ireland. Somebody needs to stand up in Kildare and go, hang on a second, what the hell is going on here, lads? And uh, maybe these four lads from Selbridge and the other people in Selbridge are going to be the ones to do that. So, look, hopefully um, a proper debate and a proper conversation is had off the back of this, but we, we'll wait and see. What's next? Uh, the Granny Rule story is back. We were talking about this last month when FIFA were due to have a virtual congress. And one of the things that was up for debate was the idea of national eligibility, players who uh, potentially appear for one country and who can then actually do a U-turn and play for another country. And this whole idea that you can play up to three times and still change your mind, uh, that got through 
in the FIFA Congress. And uh, there's a piece, it's sidebar in the Irish Examiner this morning. Uh, the FAI, once again, looking at just how wide they might be able to cast an effort players with Irish connections after FIFA's decisions to change the international eligibility laws earlier this month. Uh, so Stephen Kenny was asked about this in the press conference yesterday. And the Ryan Johansson story had been mentioned. And obviously, for anybody, like the, the reminder of this is that he was born in Luxembourg to a Swedish father uh, and a mother born in England, but who hailed from Mullingar. So the player was prevented from declaring from Ireland who he had played for at underage level because he had not applied for an Irish passport before lining out for Luxembourg at, at an underage level. So uh, obviously Stephen Kenny was asked about this and he says that the Johansson case was very prevalent since he had been in charge and a lot of the players assumed he uh, assumed people assumed qualified for Ireland didn't qualify uh, and actually the vast majority didn't qualify because they had to have Irish citizenship when they played for another country which none of them had. So this actually further muddies the water when we consider players who might end up lining out for England and because they're not good enough to get more than three caps can suddenly come back for Ireland. There is actually another step you need to go to before you make that U-turn and it is going after Irish citizenship before that. So it can't just be a whimsical thing that you happen upon because you realise that you're a one cap wonder for England. You need to have had interest. You need to have had an Irish citizenship lined up uh, before that. And that, that is why the, the, the Ryan Johansson thing um, had, uh, had been complicated on that front. The other thing then that, that comes into this piece is uh, Patrick Bamford. And I guess Mick McCarthy had spoken about uh, communication with Bamford or a lack thereof with Bamford. And like he, he had been asked to, to come on board by Mick McCarthy. Um, now, Kenny didn't say that he, he would, didn't really comment on that as such yesterday. He said he was just focusing on the Slovakia game. But um, this could be quite an addition down the line if it was something that he was interested in. Yeah. I mean, I think Patrick Bamford would probably uh, make our team the way he's playing at the moment, and certainly he'd be in our squad. Uh, another striker playing in the Premier League who's a bit more mature than the rest of them. No harm in that. It is six minutes past nine here. If uh, you want to get in touch this morning, we'd love to hear from you. 87 180 OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. The other big story in the newspapers, obviously, is what's happening in the world of rugby, and I'm delighted to say we've got Keith Wood with us this morning to talk to us about this. Keith, good morning to you. How are you? I'm excellent, thank you. How are you? Good. So the, the move from the South African provinces to join an expanded Pro 12, Pro 14, as it's going to be a Pro 16, has long been spoken about, but we got a lot of clarity on it. It's going to be the best for South African provinces who are going to be joining. And I guess the, the, the first thing is, instinctively, do you think this is a good thing or is this damaging? What, what's your take on it? Um... <coughs> I'm uncertain yet because I haven't seen the full details. Um, I'm a little bit, I was never really comfortable with the idea of the, the Pro 12 going down to Pro 14 and bringing in a couple of uh, development squads, um, development teams from, from, from South Africa. I, I just, uh, I, I wasn't that comfortable before all the stuff that's going on recently, but um, in light of COVID, there are a couple of different things. One is, you need to have as much money in the kitty as you possibly can and you need to try and get that done and sorted. But the other one is where does this fit with player welfare, the sort of the, the flip side of it. And um, I still haven't seen enough detail as to how that would actually fit in. Um, an awful lot is up in the air. I think having a, a tournament that travels from one hemisphere to another doesn't seem to make any sense for me. I, I think uh, flying down to... to be there for a week or two weeks to come back and for those teams to have to do it as well. I just think the season is incredibly congested as it is. And forget about the COVID seasons, but what it's going to look like afterwards. They're already incredibly congested. I'm not that comfortable with the idea of that being the case. I just, I think, um, I think the, um, it was the Celtic League and ever since then it has struggled for its identity. Um, it's very hard to say that this is, is a reasonable um, tournament in the base for the Celtic nations and Italy and now South Africa. Um, for me, it doesn't make geographical sense. It does make um, time sense in terms of you're playing at the same time, but but even then, it seems to be for me an uncomfortable fit. Okay, the um, 
the, the other thing that's been widely speculated about over the last uh, period of time is, of course, the potential for the Six Nations to become the Seven Nations. And uh, so ultimately, that would mean South Africa joining and playing here and moving out from the competition that they've been in for a long period of time. Um, there is a possibility that the Six Nations stays Six Nations and that Italy end up getting kicked out. But uh, this, I think, Keith, takes us very far back to the start of lockdown and our State of the Union conversations. Um, it looked for all the world like there was a period of time where a global calendar could have been agreed. And then that was off the table because it seemed like the unions couldn't. Uh, it seemed like there was very almost brinkmanship where we were very close to it. Briefings were, were put out to uh, rugby journalists around the world that it was imminent. And then all the talk disappeared. And now I wonder if this is the first of a, a number of dominoes that are going to fall that try to make some semblance of sense and begin to answer some of the player welfare issues, for example, that you've raised. Well, I think that I think that becomes very important. It's funny. I strangely, Stuart Barnes and I disagreed on this. I don't know if we did it on air or not, but I could see South Africa coming in to an international competition um, because it would actually nearly cut down on their travel, and it would only leave to one travel every two years for in, in a Six Nations type competition. I actually see merit within that and the the time zone has been very important within that. Um, I don't, I think there's going to be an awful lot of ructions over the next year because, um, you know, we started it with, with the State of the Union in, in us trying to understand it for ourselves. All the clubs and all the countries are dealing with um, Philip Brown called it an existential threat because there may be no money coming in at any stage. And you build a plan and it changes uh, at at, uh, at a decision from the government, um, I would say rightly, if they have the, the evidence to, to dictate it. So um, decisions are being made and being broken very quickly. We may end up with the survival of the fittest. And what would the game look like then? Because as it stands at the present moment in time with everything changing, I think it becomes very difficult for certain teams to survive, um, particularly the UK, actually. And there was a, a, an article I read early this morning that um, that uh, George Ford wouldn't play for Leicester. He might play one match in the first 13 matches for Leicester in this season coming because of the internationals that's going. Like That will never be allowed to last. Um, something has to break for that to be the case. Um, because in that instance, Leicester really wouldn't want to have players playing for England because they won't be playing for the club. That is a full and straight conflict of interest. Um, now, then you equally have Pat Lamb talking in the last day saying, well, we're going to lose a chunk of players to playing for England. Isn't that great? It's a totally different philosophy. He's saying, fine, it's fantastic. But they have a lot of money sitting behind them and they know that they can survive during that period of time. So it isn't like, like would like for clubs, countries, provinces, uh, we're, we're gone into an incredibly strange period of time. And it's difficult to see what the long-term outcome is going to be until an agreement is in place about what a, a global calendar looks like. Uh, it, um, let's just go back to the, the um, Pro 16 as it's going to be. Uh, obviously, the competition starts this weekend. There's a talk that the South African sides will join in March and it's some kind of hybrid for the first season and eventually a uh, whatever the, the schedule gets worked out is going to be. They're talking about perhaps having fewer games in the competition than they would have now, maybe one or two, maybe. So um, I think it, it might be a 12-game regular season and then a, a post-season. That might go some way to allaying the player welfare fears, a, a more meaningful programme of games where your frontline internationals play the vast majority of them and every, every match matters. Yeah, I look, I think that's what most people, most fans would like to have. It's very hard to bring young players through in that system, by the way. And like we castigate the Pro 14 a lot, or the Pro 12 when it was a lot, for there being a lot of games that were weak with weakened teams. But that is an opportunity to get players through. And we do need that opportunity. And if, if, if it's only every game that matters, you'll find that the top players will get squeezed to the point of where their performances will start to drop because they're playing too much. Now, I think we could still play a little bit more in Ireland, strangely. I think not as much as the UK, but we could play a couple of matches more a season. I think that wouldn't do us any harm. Um, but it's it's having a fractured competition, a competition that, you well, you play at home, 
one year and away the following year. And I know that happens in the Six Nations, but there is a lack of fluidity. And so I haven't seen all the plans in terms of what this is going to look like, because I don't know exactly that they have them tied down because of the changing COVID um, situation. So that, that chops and changes everything. So you need a high level of flexibility in year one. Um, but for me, it's, it's a patched together competition. So that's where I look at it as being something that's a bit difficult. Um, the the Premiership in England makes sense. Actually, the Celtic uh, the Celtic League made sense. It it kind of made sense after a fashion when you put Italian teams into it because they were involved in the Six Nations. But really, as a competition, it's the Celtic League. It doesn't make sense. And uh, and for me, it makes less sense going down to South Africa. So I. I, d- I don't know. I, I, if they can get the plans right for the players, that's one thing. If they can make it a coherent competition that you don't need a slide rule to figure out who qualifies, I think that's good. Um, uh, I do think the European Cup this year, um, they have, they've tidied it up. It's made it incredibly difficult for the coming season, but they've tidied it up to fit into very difficult situations. I do like that. I think that that's that's well organized for this year. It may not be for the years afterwards. But um, look, there's clarity required for all of these things. I look at it and for me, it's a hodgepodge and fans kind of like what they want to support. They want to be able to see it on on one station and not have to jump from one thing to the other. They don't want to have to guess who could possibly qualify if 15 different things happen at once. And so for me, I don't. I think it's unfinished at this stage. Uh, Keith, in the Irish Times this morning, Gordon Darcy is writing about this, and he says that only the strongest will survive when the South African teams join the Pro 16. He says Leinster have the squad to compete, but Munster and Ulster without their internationals will struggle to cope with this behemoth rugby nation. He says he envisages this this setting Scottish rugby back a decade and also voices huge concern uh, for the Welsh clubs as well. Uh, Do you go along with that, that the the weak or the, the, the vulnerable teams in the Pro 14 as it is right now are going to really struggle to make any progress? Well, I think it's I think that's an interesting uh, perspective, and I think we'll hear that in more interesting perspectives over the next week when this starts to fall in. Um, if if I bring it back just a little, there South Africa play a particular style of rugby, and it's very uh, heavy hitter forward dominated, uh, big forward dominated, giant forward dominated. That's not the only way to play. It is a successful way of playing when you are that size. But other teams need to play in a different fashion. And um, I don't know if we were dealing with that day in, day out, whether we'd be able to deal with it better. Uh, but we can't meet it head on in terms of that, because that just isn't our physique. It isn't the national physique. And if the only way to do with that is to bring in other players to be able to deal with it, it's an absolutely self-defeating purpose. So... Look, we need the the Pro 14, Pro 16, whatever it is, to help um, be a good um, building board for uh, the international team, with in association with the with the European Cup. That's what we that's what we are looking for as Irish clubs and prov- provinces. Um, for us to be going into something that takes away from that is is obviously foolhardy. But we do need a higher level of competition, and not just because of the com- the comments over the last two or three weeks because of Leinster losing to Saracens. Um, Leinster didn't play well enough on that day. Saracens played brilliantly on that day. Um, they played a very simplistic game plan and played it perfectly all the way to the end. And uh, and that's that happens sometimes. That doesn't mean that the Pro 14 isn't fit for purpose. It means that it wasn't fit for purpose in that particular moment in time. I think there uh, just because this year hasn't worked so well for the Irish provinces. Um, I don't think we write it off. That's happened three or four times in the history of professional rugby. So I don't. I wouldn't be jumping to big assumptions yet, but I think we need to look incredibly carefully over the decisions that are being made as to how they fit and suit different uh, different countries. It can't just be about the cash at this present moment in time. And in some cases, it actually has to be. And that's how difficult it is. I mean, the game is hemorrhaging money. Um, Look, you know, and we've had this discussion often, my one that I would love to see, because I think it would fill every ground in the country, in all the countries, when the grounds are allowed to be filled, 
is a British and Irish league because I think it makes sense regionally. It makes sense um, to rivalries that we have with the English clubs in particular, but some of the, the you know the Scottish clubs, the big Welsh clubs. We, we do have a good rivalry there. We have a great travelling support. Again, when that can happen, that makes sense. It also fits into what the lines would be. So one of the reasons behind this from from South Africa has been, well, it means that their players will get a a really good battle hardening before the lines go down afterwards. Um, let's just make it perfect for every for them, really, rather than for us. And I'm not saying it in that fashion. I'm not being that facetious about it. It's for me. It just seems like a, a convoluted setup. Um, I don't know where it fits for 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 us at all. And. And that's one of the issues with some of the decisions that are being made. Decisions are being made entirely for financial reasons. And I understand that. But um, I think we're at a very tough spot, actually, in the history of our sport. Absolutely. And there's loads more uh, to that that's going to, I think, become clear in recent in uh, coming weeks. One of the other things that hasn't finally been nailed down is exactly what CBC's involvement is with respect to the various deals. There's some informed whispers that everything's just gone a little bit cold at the moment. And maybe that's propelling these decisions at the moment to try and, so if you're Pro 14, uh, the owners of that competition, all of a sudden you beef up the potential TV deals by adding the new market of South Africa. And you say, come on, come on, let's, let's, let's get the, uh, the final parts of that deal worked out. Has all the CBC deal gone through with the Premiership? Has it all finished with the Six Nations? Laporte was talking about figures and new percentages recently enough as well. So, you know, I, I think um, the existential crisis hasn't gone away. It, separate to this, and, and kind of as part of the, the conversation that we've been having, like uh, about 18 months ago, we, we threw out there the whole notion, when, when the IRFU had money about whether or not they should buy into London Irish, it does seem, Alan Quinlan has, has told us on the show this week, that conversations have certainly been had at a very high level between the IRFU and uh, between London Irish about allowing players to play for London Irish and to continue to be selected within the Irish system. It's, it's a halfway house, it's, a, it's a, an Irish solution to an Irish problem. Um, does that make sense? Um, I, was, I was on the board of London Irish a long time ago, about, God, I was going to say 14, 15 years ago, and it was mooted at, at that time. Um, there were regulation problems of having another um, uh, country owning a, a, a team in a different territory. So I know that there are would and there are issues around that. Um, I've always considered London Irish as being like like we often forget the history and the history, uh, not rugby history, but the history of Ireland was that any time there was a lot of pressure. Um, like I'm saying in our time, 70s, 80s, 90s, people emigrated. They went to the States, Australia or England. And a lot of them went to the UK. But back in the 50s, a huge amount went to the UK. Um, the sons of, the grandsons of are very, very Irish and they fit into that very comfortably. But it also becomes a place for people to go to have experience. And for people who used to do that because... Uh, rugby was a hobby, then there was no issue. You played for London Irish, you could still play for Ireland. And, you know, we have structures in place in Ireland to try and protect the core players that we have uh, to keep a, a professional game in Ireland to be the most supportive it can be for the national team. And I think that that is a very good plan. Um, obviously, I didn't avail of it. I went and played in the UK and it was different. I could play in the UK and play in Ireland. Um, it's trying to stem the flow of people when people have bigger checks elsewhere to, to, to protect your players that they can do it. I think we went for a blanket ban and we, you know, we've, we've left a couple of people through that with Johnny Sexton going to do it. Um, I think we need to be a little bit more selective on how that actually works because we need to understand what the viability of the sport is in Ireland. So we should not close the door on on having an association with an Irish club. I mean, I, I look at London Irish and I wish there were a lot more Irish players playing in there. And we are churning out a lot of players. We have very little, um, we have very little spaces for professional players in Ireland. You know, each squad has 50, so that's four squads, that's 200. This is on, on, in the men's game. You have 200 uh, odd players that you can do it. We have a lot of schools and we have a lot of clubs that have players that don't quite get into that system, but they're very good players. They may develop a bit later. 
having an opportunity to have them somewhere else is great. I don't think it detracts from the game. Um, but I think we need a far more nuanced view to how we deal with players at home and away. Um, having said that, I believe that the system we have is about 95% correct and in holding on to the players here. Might the final 5% be a link-up where, and this could work two ways, where all of a sudden if you were Irish qualified, you would be drawn to play for London Irish knowing that the Irish selectors are now considering players who play there for international honours and sending players over who are coming back from injury for a year or who are uh, developmental or who are at the end of their career for a year who want to go and have a different experience. Should we have a link up with London Irish, a, a, like a, an official formalised, where we don't take, you know, the RFU don't take an ownership stake, but they will say we will continue to select players for Ireland only if they play for London Irish? Um, I think that's interesting. I think that may be considered a, a restraint of trade. I, I, it'd be really interesting to get a legal view under whether you could say that publicly and it would be that formal. But I think it could be, again, a sort of nuanced version that you actually still have a chance to play for Ireland if you're playing in London Irish. You know, it's I don't quite know what the legality of that is. I also know that the clubs in England get supports for the players that they put through their system that qualify to play for England and whether that then becomes an issue dealing with the IRFU. Um, I think, I, look, this is a topic for another state of the union because we get people on who can answer those questions rather than we speculate whether these things are allowed or not allowed. But um, look, I think if, if we are under pressure, especially in, in technical positions, in nine, two, nine, two, three, nine, ten, right? Those players, if we have... If we have four out halves playing for Ireland um, in the four provinces and they're all Irish, we're in a pretty good place, but you get one or two injuries and suddenly you're struggling. Um, it, it strength and depth for us is an, an issue in a technical position. Always has been. We're much stronger now than we have, I think, than we have ever been. And um, there, were, there were times where we had only one guy fit in those positions. And after that, you were t talking to a guy who, who wasn't... Um, he became international, but wouldn't have been international level. But for the dearth of, of depth, we have a lot more depth. This just makes it deeper still. And um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where that fits in with everything as, as it stands at the moment. But um, I think we need to further that conversation. Yeah, we'll definitely do it more in depth. It, it's it's clear though that those conversations are certainly being had at uh, at senior level, and um, we'll try and do a bit more digging to see how far they got. Um, th that technical point that you're making there brings us nicely to our final issue and that is the the dearth in the front row of depth at the moment um you know we, we've seen our best club side be annihilated at scrum time by saracens and it's the winning and losing of the game in many respects um it's been the losing of the game against england on a couple of occasions all the way going back to uh, a decade ago when uh, tom court was famously pressed into service on the wrong side of the scrum and performed exactly how you would expect what what can we do to try and fix the the issue immediately and what's our midterm plan for this well I, it's funny i look back in it and we, we we did a piece after that game but i i look back in it since um uh scrummaging the front row always get blamed right and bearing in mind i'm part of the front row union i'm going to cast the blame elsewhere i'm not uh, there, it's a it's a big technical position it's an incredibly tough position, uh, tight head in particular. Um, I would say probably tight head, hooker, loose head, uh, though loose heads wouldn't like that. Um, they're, they're just, they're incredibly tough. Um, but you are utterly reliant on all eight scrummaging. And uh, having a great scrummaging uh, tight head uh, second row is very important. Um, but ensuring your back row is down is incredibly important. Um, uh, for me, in that Leinster game, it seemed almost like a lack of concentration of all eight all the time. Now, that is something that can be changed in a week. Um, it doesn't mean you become a better scrum or, or a better... Uh, um, it doesn't mean that you win every scrum, but it means you're in a better position all the time. You have to be crafty against Saracens because Saracens are crafty and people kind of bemoan that fact, but it was ever thus. And um, I have a jersey up there from the lines and Paul Wallace scrummaging would have been definitely on the um, more illegal side going in. It was phenomenally effective. Um, 
He could do it incredibly well. He was very strong in that position. He sold a very good story to the referee. And we based a, a lot of depowering a much, much bigger team by us being lower and Wally being able to not lose his feet and stay almost with his hips square and his shoulders in. You know, it was it was extraordinary. And you have to do all of those things. So I think they can be changed. We need to dedicate more time and attention to it. And we have been incredibly limited in the amount of training that has happened uh, up to this year. So like the reason I haven't got overly upset or excited by rugby so far is we have had teams trying to get to the peak of their game three weeks into a season, effectively. Um, that's incredibly difficult. Yeah. And some teams have done it better than others. And some teams have done it a week later than others. And some of them have put everything into doing it and have, haven't been able to to finish it the following week, which is what happened to Saracens. The, I mean, the, Saracens, Saracens put everything into the game against them. And it was the you know it's the end of their next eighteen months of of top class rugby really. Um, Tyke Furlong's got a, a calf injury following on from the injury that he had apparently just recovered from. So it looks like he's going to be struggling for the two remaining Six Nations games. Do you just give Andrew Porter as many minutes as you possibly can now at this level to? try and speed up the quality experience he's getting? Like, even if he's struggling in games, do you say, in the long run, what we need is for him to come through these struggles? Or do you take somebody like that out and say, we don't want you to have your confidence damaged by this? What's the balance? Uh, I think it's both. It's strangely, it's both, because um, Andrew Porter is incredibly young for a tight head. And, like, for me, I'm really upset that Furlong's injured. He's 27. 27, you're in your pomp at 27. Now, it used to be about 31 for, for, for tight head props where they were at their best. But Furlong has got the experience behind him. He should be the most indispensable Irish player that we have. Uh, Andrew Porter, I think, has been uh, wrongly criticised over the last period of time. I think he offers quite a lot. Um but I would have him and maybe John Ryan in together um, at different times. And I often go back to how um, Australia dealt with Jeremy Paul back when I was playing and Michael Foley. Michael Foley was was an older player, was considered to be the mentor for Jeremy Paul. And Jeremy Paul was seen as the star. And sometimes they put Michael Foley on for the first 20 minutes and get Jeremy Paul to play for the next for the next hour, which seemed totally counterintuitive. But they just said, uh, Foley, take this thing out of the tail and you let Jeremy kind of deal with it afterwards. I think we need to manage how we're using our players. Um, I do think we do manage it. Um, but he has had to carry a load when uh, when the main guy in Furlong hasn't been around for all those matches. He's had to carry most of that load. And he's still very young. So I don't write off him in any way, shape or form. And it's how do you manage him properly? Yeah. Um, and so he may start and he may sit on the bench. And I don't think it matters either way. I think he will learn his way through it. But you don't learn it by being humiliated. You learn it from the next time you go in and play, you get it right, and you might get taken off before that happens. And But if I was a front row forward, I would be giving a bollocking to all the back the back rows. No, no um, sticking your head up to check and see what's happening, lads, because I'm being hung out to dry. It's very hard for a young fella to say that. But... Um, that's why it's a, it's, it's a team game and why scrummaging is the all eight. It's how you get the most out of that. And you're reliant on it. And so some players get exposed in that. Furlong might get as exposed because he's craftier and he's been around a lot longer. But look, I think Porter's the future. Um, I think our depth chart's very good. We just happen to have injuries at the moment. And that makes life very tough when you suddenly have two internationals from last season to be played, another competition of internationals, followed by next year's Six Nations. Um, that will expose fault lines in every single team. And the South Africans uh, after that, and then the Lions after that. So it's a, it's a lot of rugby to be played between now and the end of the summer. Keith, great stuff as always. Thanks a million. Pleasure. Cheers, Ger. So Keith, we'll give us some thoughts there this morning about uh, the big rugby stories that have uh, been developing over the last 24 hours or so. You can get in touch, 87 180 is the number. After this break, we're going to hear from Irish basketball star Sorka Tiernan. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. 
Looking for a football show with a bit of a twist? Ferguson has a knack for seeing Maverick and, you know, kind of creative genius and sort of letting it flow. Team 33, the football magazine show for the football purists. The very best interviews with the cult heroes of the past and a look at the cultural side of football. Team 33, live at 9 p.m. every Friday on OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. OTB Sports, in partnership with Cadbury FC, have kicked off a brand new series of in-depth chats with some of the biggest names in football. Gary Neville just rocks up tomorrow and says, yeah, I'll be a coach. No. The third episode sees Gary Neville and Teddy Sheringham sit down for an in-depth chat which will be brought to you on OTB social channels and OTB Sports Radio on Monday the 5th of October. Check out CadburyFC.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. OTB AM With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. This week, Basketball Ireland announced a partnership with Jigsaw, the youth mental health charity. A series of initiatives are planned over the coming year as part of the collaboration to help players, coaches, schools, clubs and international sides. Sirka Tiernan is a partnership ambassador. Sirka, you're very welcome to the show. How are you getting on? Not too bad, Nate. Thanks for having me. So the season is planned to go ahead from October the 17th. I guess it's been one of the last sports to get up and running basketball because of the indoor nature. Yeah, definitely. Um, we also usually don't start the season until the end of September anyway. So we're kind of about two weeks delayed, which isn't too bad. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely, we're very lucky to be able to train and stuff at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of teams in Dublin, a lot of our underage structure can't. And um, you know, we're really excited to kind of get back going properly. I saw there was social media videos involving yourself during lockdown about how players can stay active and I guess stay sharp really from a basketball standpoint. What were you doing over the last few months if the indoor facilities weren't available? Uh, well, I suppose I was lucky. I was actually in our gym. Our, it's our team sponsor as well, the Leaks of Meaties, the day they closed. So they let me bring home some weights and some equipment. So I was doing workouts out the back and we have a basket in front of myself and my brother who also plays. We're out there a lot, like practicing and stuff like that. So I was probably one of the luckier ones. I kind of had access to that kind of stuff. So just about, you know, trying to do as much as you can with like limited availability. I've often thought that actually during lockdown, those people who had siblings or parents or sons or daughters of uh, a decent yeah. standard were probably fairly well able to, to keep on top of things. Yeah, it was great. Me and uh, my brother Keen were out there more or less every day, like practicing and playing some one v one and stuff like that. So it was a nice way to kind of keep sharp. Did I see somewhere when you did an interview uh, like of uh, Q and A's with Basketball Ireland that he was down as your most respected opponent or something like that? Uh, I don't know if I'd give him that, but uh, <laughs> he is a lot taller than me and. Obviously, he's a boy, so he's definitely a good comp opponent to have over lockdown. How competitive do those one-on-ones get? Oh, very competitive. Um, my mom does get worried. She's working <laughs> downstairs out of the playroom at the moment, and that has a clear view onto the court, or on, well, not the court, the front drive. So we kind of used to wait until she went for a walk so she couldn't see us starting to play again. And, and what is it up till? Like, do you have a time limit? Do you have a score limit? Uh, we usually went to 15, but we'd often play more than one game, depending on who won the first game. I, I didn't really like to stop until I won at least one. So. <laughs> and who came out on top more often than not? I'd say it was pretty even. Um, yeah, I'd say pretty even. So it wasn't too bad. It's interesting, like, even seeing people at the very top of the game in, in the NBA trying to use their own home courts over the course of lockdown. It's... This, I guess, it threw everybody completely out of their comfort zone for a while. Even the very top professional athletes in the United States were struggling. Some of them came back into the professional game a little bit rusty. That some people just hadn't done the work that other people had. Uh, like, has there been any word from your coaches? Has there been any instruction on how to get back to your best immediately once the season starts? Yeah, well, I suppose we've now been kind of doing our preseason for four weeks. We were a little bit delayed with the Kadir lockdown. Um, but it's just kind of the first couple of sessions are definitely very messy and very rusty because even if you are doing like lots of practice and lots of 1v1, there's just no emulating the kind of 5v5 nature of basketball. Um, so it definitely took us a while to kind of brush that rust off, but the last couple of weeks have been a lot better and we've kind of been really going at it. How long does it take for you to build up that cohesion with your teammates, do you think? 
Um, it definitely depends. Like we have a couple of new players and stuff this year, so uh, it is taking a while to kind of get used to what different people like to do and what spots people like to go to and stuff like that. But like at the end of the day, like you do pick it up pretty quickly. Uh, we're playing a lot in training, so we're kind of getting used to, you know, a different system and how everyone plays like that way. I've thought that way as well about when your team has been playing at national level at underage. So you go from 2017, the under-18s, that unbelievable success at European level. And then last year as well at under-20 level, uh, coming third in uh, the under-20s, getting promoted to Division A for the first time. Is that one of the benefits of that team, having a, a similar crop coming all the way up, that you're almost playing like a club team at times? Yeah, that definitely helped us a lot. And uh, when our first under-16 year, we played a huge amount in practice. And I think even going into that Europeans, we were kind of ready to play with each other. And that's definitely a disadvantage to a lot of the Irish teams and a lot of the other teams, the national teams we played. But we were all very close. We played together like a core group of us for a very long time. And that definitely helped us kind of, you know, pick up stuff quickly and, you know, play for each other as well. What happens next from that 2019 team, uh, I guess, getting promoted to Division A? How does Division A manifest itself for you and, and that age group? I'm talking about people who are obviously too old for under-20s uh, over the next couple of years. Yeah, well, so now anyone who'd be too old for under-20s would now be trying to make a senior team. Mm. Um, so their Europeans obviously got cancelled this summer, as long with the under-20A Europeans. So it's actually going to be next year's under-20s that will get to play A. Uh, so there would have been four or five girls from our team in 2019 that would have hoped to play this summer in the A-Europeans, but that's obviously been cancelled, so now it's a new group. Uh, but yeah, it's just uh, you're moving on and you're going for a senior team then, and there's obviously a lot of very good older players as well, so it gets competitive and it gets tough. Okay, because I, I was just wondering when the, the next events were, but essentially they haven't happened yet after uh, no. last year. Yeah. Right, okay. How big an ambition, or I'm not sure if this is something you, you've thought about, is it... For you, is it for that group of players who came third last year to get the Ireland senior team to a Division A standard, to, to bring Ireland up to that level, and I guess stay there as well? Yeah, I think it's a really big ambition, not only for our group of players, but some of the older players and some of the younger players and the management staff as well. Um, I think, you know, probably about 10 years ago at this time, we kind of were at that level. Unfortunately, then with the kind of crisis and basketball and losing funding, they kind of had to step back from that. Uh, but I think it's like, we have a very good group of like players in that kind of age bracket that really want to push to try to get Ireland back to the top level of basketball in Europe again. I guess what you've heard is only anecdotal stuff. You, you weren't uh, there 10 years ago. Is your sense though that Basketball Ireland, that this team is more braced for the challenges that lie ahead now than they were 10 years ago? Uh, well, I suppose it depends. Like we probably have an advantage that we've been playing together for like a long time, and you know, competing at a high level for a long time. And I think generally, basketball in Ireland, like especially in the women's, has really improved over those ten years. And um, they were an extremely good team. Like there's a lot of legends that would have played in that team. A lot of people I would have looked up to a lot. Some who are still playing now. So definitely, they kind of like showed I'd say us that it could be done, and you know, it'd be nice to try kind of get back to that standard again. You were in with the seniors from 2018, right? Yeah, I played with them that summer, yeah. How quickly did that help your growth accelerate? Was it all positive? Or was, was there any setbacks at all when you got thrown in that young to the senior team? Uh, I think it was really, really positive. Like, right. uh, for me, like it was you know, just a huge honour to be able to play for them at such a young level and to kind of be around the calibre of players there uh, really opened my eyes to like, the amount of work that a lot of those players put in and you know, how much work you have to continue to do. Like, it's easy to, it's not easy to make a team, but once you make a team, that's only half the work. You kind of have to keep pushing and stuff like that. So that was, you know, really cool to kind of have that kind of access to some of those players for the kind of few months that, in the run-up to the Europeans. When you say the sort of work that you need to put in, what, how does that change for you then? How does your work ethic develop? What different things are you starting to do to, to get to that level after that point? Uh, well, definitely a lot more gym work. Like when I was younger, I probably didn't put enough emphasis on that and that's something I probably tried to get better at over the last few years and even just it's kind of seeing that like you know you can work hard but like you know you know if you're taking a day off that there's another five or six people there that are definitely doing work on that day and you know kind of a little bit of accountability as well so you kind of know there's always someone out there working and if you're not working you're falling behind. How how big a, an impact was that at underage level at all? Like when you, when you talk about that gym work, what was there 
uh, program that you had to, in order to get up to that speed or, or was that actually just not really a part of your underage coaching for Ireland? Uh, it was there a little bit, probably not as much as it is now. It's, in fairness, it's kind of a pretty quickly growing area in general. So even in other sports, like having that kind of strength conditioning structure at underage levels has become more popular recently. And they're definitely doing a better job of that at the underage levels now. But when I was kind of coming through, it probably wasn't as big a deal. There wasn't as much emphasis put on it. Uh, but it's definitely just something that they are looking at improving and they've done a good job of that as well. And was there a sense when you were going abroad to play in these tournaments that other countries were better equipped, were, 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 had more strength and conditioning work done, basically? Um, I'm sure that a lot of them did. Yeah. Um, we probably came to a lot of those games with players of like kind of all... Like, you know, a lot of people, we didn't look like a basketball team at times and you're kind of going up against, you know, the likes of Ukraine and they are all look the exact same. Like, you know, we were kind of all different shapes and sizes and, you know, like I'd say, they kind of looked at us in the warm-up kind of like, oh, I don't know <laughs> what these are going to do here. But, you know, we left it on the course and, you know, you don't have to be all the same to play basketball or play any sport, really. For sure. I, I think as well, is it fair to say from a point guard's perspective that, there was so much based on how well you can hit the shot, how well it comes down to your skills as, as opposed yeah. to your strength and your conditioning. Of course, that helps. And if you're I don't know, less tired come the end of the fourth quarter, yeah. you're going to be able to hit that shot better. But the repetition that you've been doing all your life, I'm sure, is the, the primary piece of practice that you've done. Yeah, of course, execution is kind of the most important thing. And, you know, stuff like working for each other is like probably one of the biggest things in basketball. And we probably that, had that in spades over other teams. And, you know, tactically as well, it gets very, very tactical when you're at those kind of tournaments and you're playing day in, day out. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot more to it than just strength and conditioning. And our skill level was quite high going over and that definitely helped us. How much responsibility do you put on yourself as a guard, whether it's for your club, whether it's for your country, in terms of actually getting on the scoreboard, in terms of hitting the three-pointer? Because, I mean, the, the 2019 National Cup final, I think you hit three of your team's five three-pointers in that decider, is that something that you go out to achieve yourself, that you are going to keep up your end of the bargain, not just with creating, but also adding a lot onto the scoreboard? Well, I think it depends on the match and kind of the matchups. Like, you know, as a point guard, like your kind of first job is to kind of control the tempo and kind of run the team a little bit. Um, that anything you kind of, like if you can score on top of that, it's brilliant. Um, like different games, like, you know, you'll have more opportunities to score other games like one of your post players might have a huge advantage and they might be the ones that are scoring. So I think it's just kind of knowing what your team needs is more important than just going out and saying, I'm going to score 20 points because, you know, you could score 20 points, but you could still lose the game. And I've always been the type of player I'd prefer to score two points and win than have 35 and lose. So, Of course. Uh, if you were to be really selfish though, which sort of game actually gets the best out of yourself? Is it if there's a lane open and you're kind of setting up the, the, the big players in your team all the time or is it when somebody leaves you totally open and you're able to get on the scoreboard? Yeah, well, if I'm wide open, I'm going to shoot the ball. I have confidence in my stats, shoot the ball. My teammates have confidence in me to shoot it. Um, but then if somebody's wide open under the basket and I have the ball at the 3.9 and we're both open, the basket, the shot under the basket is obviously a lot more high yeah. percentage and a better shot to get. So. Uh, how have you, uh, I guess this is probably more of a question at, uh, at club level uh, at the moment with uh, Liffey Celtics and all that. How have you adjusted from going to from the, the role of young player and the, the star, this up and comer, this, this three time young player of the year to being a leader in the team. So I assume that that's a transition that started to happen over the last little while that your unbelievable standards at national level will translate into a case where, right, this person is ready to be a leader in the team right now. Uh, yeah, well, it's definitely, it's kind of two different roles. Like, you know, I started playing with the team when I was 16, so I was very young and. Mm. I kind of got lucky that, you know, I got to play. We had a couple of injuries and stuff the first year I played um, and kind of broke my way into team from that. But it's just, I suppose, like, you know, it's about kind of leading by example a little bit as well and making sure you're putting the effort in and committed to all the training sessions and stuff like that. And we do have a very committed team and we have a lot of leaders on the team. Um, so it's kind of just, you know, making sure that everyone kind of feels comfortable there, the younger players feel comfortable there and stuff like that. Obviously, you know, I only just turned 21, so I'm still one of the younger players, but I've been there for a long time now. So, you know, it's just making sure that everyone kind of is happy with their role and knows their role and is kind of ready to go. Yeah, it seems to me that that is, whenever we talk to any sports person, 
the main way leadership is actually communicated is actually by playing really well yourself and running harder yeah. than everybody else in training. Yeah, and just showing people like, you know, you can kind of like if you lead by example rather than by your voice, it's generally a lot more um, effective, I think. For sure. So the season, uh, Sirica, plan to go ahead on October 17th. Uh, have you been watching much of the NBA, any of the WNBA? Uh, yeah, I have been watching a bit about um, we're kind of all basketball, basketball heads here. So we've been keeping up with the NBA with our various different teams and the WNBA as well. Um, they, their finals are due to start soon. So it's a, kind of an exciting time for to watch basketball at the moment. Who's your team? Um, in the NBA, I'd probably say Lakers. Uh, although I did really like the Nuggets as well. So it, I was kind of hoping for another two games of that series. And then the WNBA, I've always been a big fan of the Mercury. They're, they've been out in the playoffs for a while now, but they were almost my favourite team growing up. So It looks like Seattle are going to do the business in the WNBA. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I'd say so. They've been playing very well this year. And, you know, they've Brianna Stewart back after a year mm-hmm. of injury. So, you know, that's been huge for them. And then I assume you're picking Lakers, but in how many games uh, do you reckon they're going to get the job done against Miami? Uh, I'd say probably five would be my guess, but... It depends how Miami play. They've been playing very well all playoffs. And, you know, Coach Fulcher has kind of had a different defense for every team he's played against. So it depends how they play them. They could do a very job yet, a very good job yet. Mm, he seems like yeah, an unbelievable coach. Um, right, it's going to be excellent. But personally, I'm hoping for a Game 7 there at some point. I think we deserve it. As you say, the, the, the Nuggets series, if you got a Game 7 there, that would have been uh, a brilliant yeah. thing. But uh, unfortunately, we just had to get what we got. Right, this week, Basketball Ireland announced a partnership with Jigsaw, the youth mental health charity. A series of initiatives are planned over the coming year as part of the collaboration to help players, coaches, schools, clubs and international sides. Sarika Tiernan is a partnership ambassador. Thanks, Sarika. Thank you. I signed for them after the Euros. After my first day's training, I was driving home. I was actually thinking, regretting it, what have I done? I like I walked into a circus. It's amazing, isn't it? It's a shortened deal or no deals today. Phil is here with us. Phil, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you doing? So we're going to be as rapid fire with this as we possibly can. Okay. Yeah. Manchester United have had a £91.3 million, £100 million Euro bid rejected by Dortmund for Jadon Sancho, according to Sky Sports. They fear they're losing face if they make another offer for Sancho. And then it's rejected. That's according to the Mail, who obviously are big on losing face. <laughs> are they being stubborn or a bit stupid? Well, is it not a bit stupid considering... Dortmund said that's what we want and United still haven't matched it. So that to me would seem like United aren't actually fully committed to doing this. And it's it's amazing. We were just talking before we came back on air about how it's actually quite straightforward to do deals, but United don't seem to be able to do them. That's the point Gary Neville's making on yeah. Twitter this morning. All the clubs are doing it. Why can't United do it? A si- the club a si- the size of United can't get deals done. I get that they're shopping from a different market than a lot of their, the other clubs in the Premier League because they have to go for quality. They have to go for the A-listers because they don't have enough A-listers in their squad at the moment. And they haven't been able to develop players into A-listers themselves. Let's talk briefly about... So, Luka Jovic, apparently, they've joined the race for that. They're also, apparently, um, in the race for Usman Dembele. This is if the Sancho stuff doesn't happen. Would either of these do a job? Would both of them do a job? If Jadon Sancho doesn't land? Well, I know all transfers are a risk, but Jovic went to Real Madrid for big money off the back of a great season with Frankfurt, scored a couple of goals for them last season. Now, he actually played at the weekend for them, but you you don't really see him having a future at Real Madrid. He needs to rebuild his career. I'm not sure United's the best club to go to at the moment because the pressure is on as soon as you walk in the door. With Dembele, we know how good he is, but he's got too many injuries. And... He doesn't seem to be too keen to leave Barcelona because now he's probably thinking, new manager, Suarez is gone, maybe they get more opportunity. But again, you're taking a big risk on a guy that's 23 but has already had several hamstring injuries. Edinson Cavani, according to TalkSport, is a target? <laughs> he's an upgrade on a Gallo, a serious upgrade on a Gallo. He's a free transfer. But is this not going back to what they kind of did with the likes of Falcao? Yes. And they, they took punts on these on these players and it just didn't work out. Yes, very expensive punts on players who were way yeah. past it. Schweinsteiger, you know, someone's got to look at that team sheet and see Schweinsteiger and go, wow. World Cup, World Cup winner. 
Uh, Manchester City have announced the signing of Ruben Diaz for 65 million, with Nicolas Otamendi going the other way for less than 14, which is a, a haircut of 26 million at least on what they paid for Otamendi. Guardiola apparently wants to sign a new left back before the transfer window shuts. He agrees with us that their full backs are actually a bit rubbish at the moment. Uh, David Alaba and Ajax and Argentina's Nicolas Tagliafico, both 28, are on Manchester City's radar. These would both improve Manchester City's defence, right? Yeah, obviously Alaba would be a better player to get because he can play anywhere across the back line. He can also play into midfield where obviously Guardiola will probably end up playing him anyway. But <laughs> the, the worry for Manchester City is regardless of who they get, it's the mentality of this squad now. The, the real concern is their spells and games where they look so vulnerable. Wolves obviously scored in the first game. They should have scored more. Leicester blitzed them in the second half. And then you've got a shake that owns a club, yet Aguero's injured, Jesus is out, and you're turning to a 17-year-old, Liam Delap, to try and turn it around. And within a few minutes of bringing him on and Fernandinho off, the whole thing broke down and Leicester ran riot because Rodri is not Fernandinho. And it, as I said, the concern is that when, they're put, when things are put up to Man City, this team don't seem to have the strength to be able to, to battle through it. And you're looking at their, their rivals for the, for the title, Liverpool, they're the complete opposite. They have mentality oozing out of them. And Manchester City, the most impressive mentality they showed was the season that they finished with the winning run to see off Liverpool on the final day of the season. Other than that, in big games, in big European games, City have it's been a mistake or let themselves down. And Guardiola's let them down as well with some of his team selections. Is, so is, is Alaba still at it? Is he still as good as he was? He's been playing centre back for for Bayern, and obviously, you know, the way they play with the high line, they they attack with the full backs. So it'd be a comp it'd be a little bit of a different experience from. He's not going to get, you know, can you imagine Alaba playing those games where they're just putting balls in on top of him, like pace and. Ability on the ball is where Alaba is is an excellent player, but uh, physicality, I'm not sure. Okay, so sorry, if they sign him, do you expect him to play fullback? Um, I, I mean, what is a fullback with Pep Guardiola? You're basically you're up over the halfway line. He doesn't. Alaba isn't going to be as explosive going forward as say Mendy is, but obviously he's going to be a better defender. What does Guardiola want from his fullback? I don't know. I don't think he knows anymore. No, I think he's in his own head at, at like a deep. Existential level, almost like he just looks at his fullbacks now. He's like, next, please. You know, although Kyle Walker is still there, he was one of the originals that he signed. Mendy was there as well, got the injury, but Mendy makes too many mistakes. Okay, so very briefly, in our final ninety seconds here, uh, from a Manchester United perspective, tell me what's going to happen this week in the transfer window. They're going to sign a couple of players, but they're going to be ones that will look great on paper, but might not essentially work out. If they sign Sancho. It's a game changer for them because it sends out a great message. But I also worry for United if they don't sign Sancho, what message does that send to the, the supporters and the other players that they had one job to do during this whole transfer window and they didn't get it done? Do you believe Manchester City's transfer business is done for the summer? No, definitely would need to get more players. But looking at their fixtures between now and say their next eight games, there's so many of those games, honestly, I can't make a legitimate case for City to absolutely nail on to win these games. Even the Leeds game this Saturday could be an absolute nightmare for City given how Leeds play. They're going to get chances. All right, that is deal or no deal for this day. I signed for them after the Euros. After my first day's training I was driving home, I was actually thinking, regretting it, what have I done? I like I walked into a circus. It's amazing, isn't it? Pep must have been listening to us yesterday, Owen. You'd look at Tottenham Hotspur and think to yourself, could Manchester City have copied Tottenham's transfer strategy this summer and had a better summer as a result of doing that? Sign like, Gareth could Bale. Sign Matt Doherty, Reglon, Gareth Bale, maybe not Gareth Bale, but certainly the, the first two, if, as you say, the conversations have been had within Manchester City and not just uh, on sports shows about the weakness in their fullbacks or the perceived weakness of their fullbacks, then should they not have identified this a lot sooner? Because two of the best wing backs around have been snapped up because Tottenham Hotspur identified that these are the positions that we needed to strengthen in and they've all gone out and they've already got them. Um, so I find it very interesting. I, I, like I, if even the fact that they're 
making moves, if, if these stories are true, to, to go and get a Tagliafico or to go and get a David Alaba, that is actually remarkable in itself, is it not? That it has taken them until this point for them to realise that. Like, obviously, there was interest in Ruben Diaz. They signed and they started the start of the, of, the, of the window and they knew that centrally they needed bolstering. But if they're suddenly waking up after two games of the season and saying, God, we need fullbacks, that is terrible management because you don't even know what your weakness is. Um, just on the point that Phil made about Delap, do you buy that they had to play Delap, or was there something else going on there? You know the way that frequently Mourinho would pull out a team, the team would lose, and he would essentially be pointing up to the director's box going, look at the crap that you've given me to play with, I need a centre-back. Uh, was, was there a bang of that off, the, off picking the 17-year-old, or is he actually you know, the new Erling Haaland? I think the one way you could make a mitigating factor for it being the new Erling Haaland, but not necessarily that, is because they didn't have Jesus, they didn't have Aguero, and they didn't have a proper centre forward, and maybe he felt they were lacking that. But you look at their bench the other day, and I'm just going to get it up here. I think there could be an element of pointing to the stands as well. Uh, so you had Zinchenko, you had Zach Steffen, good old Zach Steffen, uh, you had uh, Laporte, you had Ferran Torres, who came on, you had Liam Delap, you had Tommy Doyle, and you had Cole Palmer. Right. These are like football manager regens sitting on Pep Guardiola's bench. Zinchenko's so, missus had to issue a statement apologising, or Zinchenko had to issue a statement apologising for his missus criticising Pep in the Champions League. Did you see that? I did. I'm like, well, well I, I, it's the Streisand effect. I hadn't seen her criticisms of Pep, but i sure I'm going to go and look them up now. Um, that's a real sign that this he's no longer again not actually a fullback but playing fullback for the team somebody who we could have included in that list of players who have failed at fullback for uh, Manchester City under Pep Guardiola we were getting hammered on uh, Twitter for yesterday but anyway I stand by almost everything that we said yesterday in Manchester City the current car crash element will be interesting to see but if they get Alaba that would be a game changer I think it's 10 o'clock oh and good stuff thanks a million Cheers. We'll be uh, seeing you tomorrow. Uh, leaders questions today with Bill Bezik at noon and Stuart Lancaster. OTB Gold is a brilliant interview with Kath Catherine Switzer from the 1967 Boston Marathon. Women weren't allowed to run. She ran anyway, um, got stopped and completed the race. It's a brilliant uh, story and she was a proper trailblazer. Damien Delaney's career retrospective with Joe Malloy at 3 o'clock. Our retro panel is losing the dressing room with uh, Dermot Ling and Derbal O'Rourke and then Dr Harry Edwards on OJ. A brilliant piece about the OJ documentary series, which is the greatest sports documentary of all time. That one is 6 o'clock today on OTB Sports Radio. You just download the sports app, OTB Sports app, and click the uh, play button on radio. And uh, we're there all the time, 24 hours, non-stop, free gratis and for nothing. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow at half past seven. We're back on air and online from seven tonight on Off The Wall and Newstalk. Take care. OTB AM With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what...